This is Jocko Podcast number 190 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. And joining us once again is Dave Burke. Good evening, Dave. Good evening. The last three podcasts Dave has been on, 187, 188, and 189, and we have been talking about the first six chapters of the Marine Corps publication called the One Tac Three Tactics. And if you haven't listened to those three podcasts, go start with those. You'll hear about Dave Burke. And if you have listened to them, then we're going to continue on today. The last, the last podcast of this series. Hopefully we can make it through the last two chapters, chapter seven and eight. Marine Corps First Lieutenant at the basic school time now. Are they listening and getting anything out of this particular series of podcasts? <laughs> Based on the number of messages I get from lieutenants at TBS just talking about this podcast, they are listening in a way that, and, and, and learning things that I never learned when I was at TBS. Uh, the impact of this on the Marine Corps is huge because the fact that listening to this stuff and looking at this manual totally differently than I did 25 years ago. There's um, <clears throat> there's just a different way to observe things through a different lens than your own, and and when you're young, hey man, and listen, any of those any first lieutenant at TBS right now, I will trade places with you immediately. If I can do that, I will I will trade places with you right now. I, I, will, I would give anything to be in that position. But, so, it's, so, so I'm not trying to disparage your situation in life. <laughs> what I'm saying is, when you're seeing this for the first time and you're 21 years old, you just don't have the, the breadth of experience to go, oh, I can, I can relate to that. And for me, that's what learning is. And I've complained about this before in schools, in all schools. Every subject that you learn in school should be tied with a thread to every other subject that you learn in school because it is because everything that you learn about is tied to everything else. That's that, that's the way it is. The science, the art, the literature, they're all interwoven through history, through mankind. And so what happens is if you can tie those threads together, then you get a better understanding of what is actually what you're being taught. So what I like and what why I appreciate the fact that the young military personnel, whether in the rink or whatever service they're in, they can take what your experiences is, Dave, what my experience, and we can weave some other aspects of this information in so that so that people, including me, get a better understanding of of this knowledge because the knowledge is there. I mean the knowledge is there, the framework is there. And I and I'll, I'll get to a point where I I I I I make a critique of this manual. And the critique of this manual that I make is it's there's a level of simplicity one that that they could they could make things a little bit clearer and a little bit more simple a couple times. There's some times where I think it could be a little bit simpler and a little bit a little bit a little bit simplified, a little bit more straightforward. To be honest with you, that's what I think. Cover, move, simple, prioritize, and execute, and decentralize command. That is like the the base level of, hey man, this is what you need. And then this all just builds so so perfectly on, upon that. And and of course, there's that's like one situation. There's the other eighty. The other ninety eight percent of this is where I look at it and go, yeah, they wrote this way better than I ever could have than Dave, than you ever, like we just don't have, and that's that's why, I, even though I said the last podcast, like I know there, was, there had to be one guy that was like overseeing this, yeah. but the group of people that put this thing together, they were good at what they did, and, and they did a great job doing this, so I'm glad to be able to talk about it. I'm glad to be able to learn from it. And it's amazing because I don't remember when I read this for the first time, I I don't know. I know that, and I was telling you this earlier, Dave, when I came back and wrote down the laws of combat for the first time, those were, 
look, I absolutely, I know I plagiarized them from various places, but they were, but I didn't, I didn't say, oh, this, this comes from here. Cover move, I know where I learned that from for the first time. I learned it from Roger Hayden. It's actually the first time I learned it. I was like, oh, okay. Well, that's the first time I put it together. I'd heard it before. That's the first time I said, oh, that's what that actually means. The simple thing, kind of the same thing. You know, some of those old Vietnam guys, you got to keep things simple, you know. Uh, prioritize and execute. That's, I had to put a word to, I had to put words to that. Because I didn't have, I'd never, before I wrote that down, I had never told anyone to do those things. I said it in a million different ways. I had said it in a million different ways, but I never said, okay, this is prioritized next week. That's what you need to do. Decentralized command, obviously people have been saying that for a really long time. But for me, the first time I wrote them down was when we got back from Ramadi. And I didn't, like I said, I knew that I kind of plagiarized them. But at the same time, I couldn't point to the sources, right? I couldn't say, oh yeah, I took this from here, I took that from here, I, I couldn't. It was a bunch of information that was in my head that had been uh, fermenting for a long period of time. And then when I realized I had to teach this stuff, I, I needed to write it down in a, in a distilled manner. So wh- so then, and I was t- this, this is the, getting to the part that I was telling you, I was telling you that once I wrote these four laws, I was kind of like a little bit paranoid, because here I am, you know, getting up on a pedestal and saying, hey, here's the laws of combat, which is a really arrogant, like, statement to make, right? To say, oh, I've written the laws of combat. Like, no, like, that's not what I'm saying. And I, and I questioned, as I started putting them out to guys, I started questioning, like, okay, how universal is these? Are these the right way? Is this the right way to go? Is this the right thing to think about? Have I captured these correctly? And one of the ones that I was most concerned about, oddly enough, because it's the most obvious one, was simple, was keeping things simple. And, and part of that reason was because, man, the planning had gotten so completely crazy and out of control in the SEAL teams and in the whole US military, the 96 hour planning cycle, it had just gone completely buck wild crazy. And I, as a being raised that way in the SEAL teams, I had to, I, I was a little nervous about saying to myself, look, hey, I've been told about all this detailed planning for the last 15 years, 16 years, 17 years of my life. And now I'm saying, no, what you gotta do is keep it simple. And so I started reading through some of these manuals that I had skimmed through, yeah. that I had looked through, that I had, that I had looked down on. If you showed me this manual, if I read this manual when I was an E5 in the teams, I'd have been like, oh, whatever, man. I'm in the teams. You know, that's, I'm just being straight up. That's what my attitude would have been. As I started, so, so then when I referred back to them and I started going, okay, let me confirm some of what I'm saying. And when I started, so the first one that I really looked at was simple because I felt like, oh, I'm telling guys to be simple, but is that really the right answer? And I found that keeping things simple is a military maxim of war that has been around since the beginning of war. Since the beginning of war, they've been saying, hey, dumbass, you gotta keep things simple. And then from there, I continue to read these different perspectives, these different manuals, these different historical documents, and it just it, the same things just get repeated over and over and over and over again, and that's, that's why when you hear it from a different angle, a different perspective, and especially one that's this clearly written, it's like, yes, this makes absolute sense. So when I say there's a little critique I wanna make, I trust me, I am not making a critique of like, hey, listen to me, I know. No, all I'm saying is like, I guess what I'm saying is this is where I think it fits together. This is where I think, you know, being able to explain something to people from a different, just a slightly different angle, it's beneficial. And there's be plenty of people that will go, well, you know, Jocko's point's okay, but the Marine Corps tactic thing, the Marine Corps manual explains it better. And and there's some people that will say, oh, you know, the Marine Corps tactics thing makes sense, but I actually received it better when I heard Dave say this, or I heard Jocko say that. Like that's, so, so when you take these things and you, parse them 
and you look at them, and you look at them from your viewpoint, from my viewpoint, all it does, all it does is gives people a better understanding. And what that understanding does is it gives you the ability to recognize these patterns in more in different places. If you've got the humility to recognize that 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 point of view exists in a whole bunch of different places, I, I read Extreme Ownership at the end of my career, <laughs> at the tail end of my career. And what I learned from that at the time was significant, but more importantly, I've gone back and reread that and seen different things in it. And I think the key more than anything is it actually doesn't matter which of those ones speak to you the right way. It's the recognition that, and it goes back to when you know the way broadly, you see it in all things. It the ability to, to see something and read something and have that teach you something that you, no matter how long you've been doing it, whether you're a second lieutenant of the basic school or a colonel in the Marine Corps, that you will find these lessons in these different perspectives in a whole bunch of different places. And what's required is the humility to, to, to recognize that you're gonna learn things from a different perspective. And if you keep an open mind on when you're reading this stuff, you'll go back, if you're a lieutenant of the TBS, you're gonna read this one, three, and five years, and it's gonna say totally different things to you if you go in with that mindset of, you are gonna take something away from it different than the first time. Yeah. And the, you know, we talked about on the last podcast, getting reps in, right? <laughs> getting reps in, you know, in whether it's training, whether it's you in an airplane maneuvering around the sky against an enemy with a wingman, whatever, you get reps in. And you get reps in doing immediate action drills out in the desert or in an urban environment. You get reps in. And then as a leader, you get the reps in of, oh, here's something I don't recognize. How can I put my recognition over what I'm looking at and how can I make a good decision? You get reps in. And the more reps you get in, the better you get. As you go through tactics and you start to think about it and you start to pick them apart and you start to hear them from different angles, it's a rep. And every rep you get makes you a little a little tiny bit better. So when I hear the Marine Corps tactics manual talking about cooperation, and I've been talking about cover and move consistently for, for a long time, uh, let me think, for 12 years, 13 years, I've been talking about cover and move. And yet, they come in, they call it cooperation. It's the same thing, but guess what? I know it better now. Yeah. I have just a little bit more now. I, I understand it a little. I have I now understand cover and move as cooperation. And that's actually the way I describe it. Is I say cover and move is teamwork. They say cooperation is teamwork. Guess what? Same thing, a little bit different angle. I now have a better understanding of it. And that means I'm gonna be able to recognize it in different places. It, where I might not have I might have seen it in ninety-four. Places out of 100. Now, I'll, now maybe I'll see it in 96. Maybe I'll see it in 95, but I'll see it better. I'll see it more clearly. So no matter where you are in your, on, on the path, no matter where you are on the path, you're gonna, you're gonna see more. And this is something Leif and I have talked about. We, like the first muster, or no, we did an event with someone and then they came to the muster. And they said, oh, I really like the way you changed the, the 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 laws of combat <laughs> and Leif's like we didn't change we haven't changed anything as a matter of fact the the slides that you saw are the same slides that you saw when you came to when we came to your company two and a half years ago or whatever but to your point what happened to that individual's his perspective changed yeah. we didn't change but your per, but that individual's perspective changes and that's what you know, I always talk about the the fact that Mike Sorelli, when Mike Sorelli took over the junior officer course from Leif, and I was going in there with each class and going through the laws of combat brief, and on the ninth time I taught it, when Mike Sorelli was running it, and I and he pulls up a chair in the back and sits down with his notebook, and I'm like, bro, bro are you gonna sit through this again? And he's like, well, yeah. And I said, but why? And he goes, because I, I learn something new every time. and. You know, you talk about this a lot. You talk about the fact that clients need repetition. Yeah. And how often how often do you teach somebody about cover and move or simple or and and they go, "Oh, cool, got it." Yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. No, it doesn't. And it doesn't happen for any of us. And even if you do get it, something sinks in, 
it only sinks in a little bit. And then you've got another, and this is, it's not just so you see it different, you can actually teach it different. It's another way to explain the exact same thing, knowing that the people working with you, some will understand it when they see it this way, some will understand it when they see it that, that way. And the more different ways you can explain it, the quicker they learn to see it in all the other places that actually will help it really sink in. I don't care who you are, me included, none of it sinks in the first time. No. And even when it does sink in, it's not the whole thing. And to take this one step further, so Jimmy Page, my, my favorite, I guess my favorite example of this is Jimmy Page, the guitarist from Led Zeppelin, arguably the, the greatest rock and roll guitarist of all time, who was incredibly beyond comprehension creative with that instrument, the guitar, the git box. He was so creative but he was a studio musician for many, many years. And he was one of the best studio musicians in London, which is no, no small feat because London is a music town. So he had this, and when you're a studio musician, you play the notes that they tell you to play. Then you play them how, you're, how they're written on the page. It is 100% discipline, follow orders, you do what you're told. And then guess what? Once you have that, those standard operating procedures down, then you can take them and you you can get creative and you see the patterns where you no one else sees them. So the same thing, the same exact thing happens with the laws of combat. The better you know them, the better you can take and you can get creative. You can creatively apply them to problems and and, and they overlay properly on those problems because you understand how to use them better. So, I mean, I find that all the time. Clients we've been working for a long time, or clients that have, you know, people that read the read the book ten times, read read Dichotomy Leadership fourteen times. They've listened to every single podcast, and they'll be presented with a problem at their job, and and the first thing they do is blame someone. The first thing they do is is make a really complex solution. It's like it's hard to do. Now, the and, and different people learn at different rates. Yeah. Because we've got clients, I've got clients that could easily teach teach, teach classes for yeah. Echelon Front because they're so good and their business is doing great because they've come so far and they've absorbed so well. And I will tell you right now, the common trait that every single one of those, those high level appliers of the laws of combat to their business, every single one of them is like the most humble, humble. incredibly humble human that is like, oh yeah, oh, well, you know, I went to this school and I've been doing this for this long. Yeah, and it doesn't matter because I know I'm not a good leader and I'm gonna get better at it. So, that's a way to kick it off. Now, going, going to the book. One, tack, three, tactics. We're on chapter seven. Chapter seven is called Exploiting Success and Finishing. <laughs> Here's some quotes it starts off with. Do not delay in the attack. When the foe has been split off and cut down, pursue him immediately and give him no time to assemble or form up. Spare nothing. Without regard for difficulties, pursue the enemy day and night until he has been annihilated. That's Field Marshal Prince Alexander V. Suvorov, who is a Russian general who fought against the Ottoman Empire, who fought in the, against the Polish uprising, who fought in the Italian campaign. The Italian campaign, which was actually not a, not a war against the Italians, it was a war against the French, it was a war against Napoleon's army. He never actually came face to face with Napoleon, but he fought him and did very, very well. And that's where this next little quote comes from. It says, pursue the last man to the Adda and throw the remains into the river. Same, same guy, Field Marshal Suvarov. And that's what he's talking about. They fight in the French in Italy. And what you do, you pursue them to the Adda River. And then you, once you've killed them, you huck their remains into the river. That's the level of finishing that we're talking about. And then the last quote that they kick this off is, when we have incurred the risk of a battle, 
We should know how to profit by the victory and not merely content ourselves according to custom with possession of the field. <laughs> hey, just getting the field isn't good enough. That's not good enough. Don't, don't, don't accept that. And that's Maurice de Sachs, who we've covered on this podcast, podcast number 110, Reveries on the Art of War. De Sachs was a German soldier. He was a, he was a leader in the army of the Holy Ro- Roman Empire. And he ended up being one of the lead generals of France. So knows what he's talking about. And what he's talking about is just because you won the field, not good enough. Keep going. And here's how the Marine Corps puts it. It is not enough merely to gain advantage. The enemy will not surrender simply because he is placed at a disadvantage. The successful leader exploits any advantage aggressively and ruthlessly, not once, but repeatedly until the opportunity arises for a finishing stroke. (laughs) Can we just stop the podcast there? The successful leader exploits any advantage aggressively and ruthlessly, not once, but repeatedly until the opportunity arises for a finishing stroke. Yeah. We must always be on the lookout for such opportunities, whether we create them in whether we create them ourselves or they arise in the flow of action and when we perceive an opportunity to be to be decisive, we must seize it. The application of Marine Corps tactics does not mean that we expect to win effortlessly or bloodlessly or that we expect the enemy to collapse just because we outmaneuver him. It means we look for and make the most of every advantage and apply the decisive stroke when the opportunity presents itself. Building on the advantage. Once we have gained the advantage, we exploit it. We use it to create new opportunities. We then exploit those opportunities to create others, shaping the flow of action to our advantage. This is so much jujitsu. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's so much everything, but the direct correlation to jujitsu is just crazy. Even small favoring circumstances exploited repeatedly and aggressively can quickly multiply into decisive advantages. This is when you're rolling with Dean Lister and you give him part of one quarter of an inch of arm position, and he gets it. And, and you think, well, you know, that, no big deal, it's just a quarter of an inch in arm position, and then he exploits that small circumstance repeatedly and aggressively until he's got your arm and he's ripping it off your body. That's what I'm talking about. Well, back to the book, like the chess grandmaster, we must think ahead to our next move and one beyond it. How am I going to use this advantage to create another one? For example, an attack by penetration, once we have created one advantage by punching through the enemy's position and getting to his rear, we create another by pouring forces through the gap, generating the expanding torrent that Liddell Hart wrote about. You keep going, relentless attack. Yeah, and those those windows, those opportunities, not only are they fleeting, like th- those are going to be seconds sometimes that, that that opportunity is actually there before he figures out a way to, to prevent that from happening. All the other resources that you need to bring to bear for that have to be ready to go. So these things that they're describing, as simple as they're describing, look for an opportunity. Those windows are really, really small. And when you see them, you might get one in an entire fight. You might get one, maybe two. You have to have all those other things that you need to win ready to go and fill that unrelenting until the end. They are making, I mean, they're describing in a very simple way, but man, that is, to see that and exploit that to the finish. Yeah, and I'm not, to me sometimes the the um, people will talk about like how it, the importance of mindset, right? This is one of those things, what you just said is like you have to have the mindset. Yeah. Pre, prior to the opening happening, you have to be thinking, as soon as I see this, I am going. And if you don't have that, the split second that it takes you to look at it and go, wait, I think that's an opening. I think I should go. The, the, the opening's gone. gone. So having that proactive and pre-existing mentality 
of when I see this, I'm going, you know you see kids wrestling and shooting takedowns? Like that's what they're doing. They are so pre-planned to, once they do that setup and that that counter starts to take place and they see that, boom, they're in there. There's no thought process going. And if you think about it for one millisecond, that opportunity is gone. Rommel recounts how exploiting each advantage in the battle for Cook in the Carpathian Mountains during World War I led to another opportunity. As his detachment exploited each situation and moved further behind enemy lines, it generated more surprise and advantage. During this actions, during this action, Rommel's detachment captured thousands of enemy soldiers with very little fighting, due largely to his unwillingness to lose momentum. One success led directly to another opportunity which he seized immediately. And that's from that's from Rommel's book, Attacks, Infantry Attacks, which is a great book. We haven't covered it on here yet. It's super tactical. It is super tactical. It is like talking about where to maneuver squads. It's that tactical. What's good about it, and when I covered on the podcast, every section in that book has a little um a little italicized last three, four paragraphs that explain what just happened. Like, hey, here's, it's it's not quite like a full lessons learned. It's not quite, hey, here's the let take away from this. But it but some of them are pretty close. So when I cover attacks, infantry attacks on here, I'll probably do that, but that's what we're talking about. I'm not gonna slow down, I'm not gonna stop. The people, when we work with companies and they have these really good business leaders that we're working with, CEOs or guys that are just in the game, that's how they are. That's how they are everywhere in their life. <laughs> Everything in their life is like they are always looking everywhere in life for those little fleeting opportunities, and they are so they are so triggered and ready to attack those positions when they reveal themselves. It, it's and you talk about the mindset. It. it when you see it done, it permeates all aspects of people's lives, and they look for those windows everywhere. And it's something you actually have to, you don't wanna look back on your life and think of all the times that you missed to attack whatever opportunity was there. Mm -hmm. And think about how often that happens. But just think about the guys that we work with, the ones that are really good, it's not just at work, and they're like some different person, it's like that all the time. Yeah, and obviously, what can we screw up here? We can attack every open every, that, we see, yeah, yeah. that we see. That's the dichotomy. So the the more experienced you are as a leader, the better you can, the better you can see the pattern recognition. Then you recognize what opportunities are good and what aren't. Somebody asked yeah. me this the other day, like, you, what opportunity? How do you sort through all these yeah. opportunities? You know, and for me, I, I definitely. I mean, I get a lot of opportunities. And which ones am I going to invest time into? What's the and here's the, here's what the answer is. Did the answer to that question is okay? How much investment is it going to take from me time wise? Because I don't have enough time to do everything that I want to do. It makes me mad, but I I don't. And so and then what's the return on investment going to be? How is it interact and support every other thing that I've yeah. got going on? Because I'm not going to go and start some venture that's outside that doesn't positively support everything else that I'm doing. Yeah, the pieces that fit in it, everything else and make everything else better, uh, those are the ones that you have to attack on, the ones that fit in everywhere else in your life. Yeah. yeah. After the battle for Tarawa in November 1943, Major Henry Crow, commanding officer of 2nd Battalion, 8th Marines, was asked why he thought the Japanese had been defeated so quickly once the Marines were established ashore. He remarked that it was due to the constant pressure of naval gunfire, bombs, and mortars. The Marines used their advantage in supporting arms to create opportunities for success. That pressure, putting that pressure on. When you put the pressure on, that's what creates the opportunities. That's what you feel at one in jiu-jitsu all day long. Andy was working me over on the mat yesterday. Constant pressure, constant attack, it was me just trying to fill in the gaps as they were opening up. And how long can you fill in the gaps for? You, you can't do it indefinitely because when you're filling in one gap, guess what's happening? Another gap is opening up. 
And so you gotta be careful of that. That's the, going back to what we just talked about. Like if you try and fill gaps that don't, that aren't good opportunities, you're leaving other areas exposed and that's gonna be a negative. Next section is called Consolidation, Exploitation, and Pursuit. Once we have created leverage, how do we take full advantage of it? A decisive result or victory rarely stems from the initial action, no matter how successful. More often, victories are the result of aggressively exploiting some relative advantage until one becomes decisive and the action turns into a rout. Victories are the result of aggressively exploiting some relative advantage until one becomes decisive. Casualty rates historically tend to remain constant and often fairly even until one side or the other tries to flee. Only then do significantly asymmetrical casualty rates commonly occur. This exploitation of the enemy's bad situation can yield surprisingly great results. We can take several specific types of actions to exploit opportunities we have created or discovered. The first way we can exploit success is by consolidation. As we consolidate our forces after seizing a position we intend to hold against the enemy. Here, our aims are limited to protecting what we have already gained. We must realize that by consolidating, rather than continuing to force the issue, we may be surrendering the initiative. That's talking about holding position. There, are, there may be any number of reasons for choosing this course. Perhaps we lack the strength to continue to advance. Our new gain may be, may be of critical importance and the risk of losing it outweighs the advantages of any further gains. Perhaps the new gain itself grants a significant advantage. For instance, a position that provides excellent fires or threatens the enemy lines of communications may put the enemy in an untenable position. Perhaps... The new gain compels the enemy to meet us on our terms. For example, we seize a critical piece of terrain with strong strong defensive qualities, forcing the enemy to attack on unfavorable terms. So there are times where you hold position. There are times when you strong boy, you you consolidate your forces, you get everyone together, you, you, you dig in. There are absolutely times to do that. And they say it too, and if you do that too long, that can stifle the, the the initiative and and I need I think about this sometimes is that and I I need to be more careful sometimes and I think about this even with clients that I work with every time I say something I know that there's a dichotomy to what I'm saying that there is no absolute and I sometimes forget to say and if you push too aggressively you can get too spread out every everything that's being said here and all the conversations we're having make it by definition there is a dichotomy and all that you can go too far in any of these directions. So as you read this and listen to these things, and even the things that I say, we don't always talk about what the dichotomy is, but that's a perfect example of, hey, we can consolidate. That might be the right thing to do. But if we do that too much, we lose the advantage we have of how fast what our, what our, our, our tempo is. And if we're too aggressive and get too spread out and too thinned out down the line, then that could be a, a, a problem too. There's a dichotomy in every action that we can take as a leader. And I know that in my head, and I don't always articulate and say that, but that's the way we should think in all the movements, no matter how aggressive we're going to be, to remember you can overdo all of this stuff. Yeah. Well, that's one of the reasons we we wrote the dichotomy of leadership is because, and I when I first started talking about the dichotomy of leadership, I would say it was because a lot of questions we got were about the dichotomy of leadership. But the real reason we wrote it is because the answers are about the dichotomy of leadership. Yes. And every, and it's a, it's a, and and I talked about this already on this series of podcasts that, that the reason, one of the things that brought the dichotomy of leadership to my brain was the fact that what was, was I had to admit that I was wrong. I had to say, you know what? Being aggressive, be aggressive, be aggressive, be aggressive. And, and then I realized oh, that can be wrong. Oh, you can be too aggressive. Yes, you can. Oh, you can strong point a building too long. And that was something we'd see all the time in training was we'd, we'd be attacking guys in an urban environment. They would do the right thing and strong point a building. And if they got bogged down in that building, then they would get surrounded and they'd get picked off and they'd get slaughtered. If they strong pointed that building, they made a quick rapid plan on how they were gonna break out of there they would do fine. So they had to find that 
they had to find that balance. <laughs> the second way to pursue an advantage is through exploitation, an offensive tactic that is designed to disorganize enemy in depth. Exploitation usually follows a successful attack that has created or exposed some enemy vulnerability. For example, an attack that has torn a gap in enemy defenses allows us to attack vital enemy areas. The object of exploitation is not to destroy the combat forces directly opposing us, even though they may be weakened. Instead, the object is to disrupt the entire enemy system by attacking important activities and functions. It's real easy to get distracted into the little tactical battle that you could win, as opposed to looking at what's going on strategically and how you can attack, how you can disrupt the entire enemy system. In Desert Storm, there was, I'm sure most people have heard of, there's something called the Highway of Death. Mm -hmm. And there was this string of enemy armored vehicles that went for miles and miles and miles up into, into Iraq, out of Kuwait. And that started, and I don't know 100% of the story, but it started with this formation of, of fighter attack aircraft that under most circumstances, you would hit that lead element. That's the tactical smart thing to do. It preserves the most amount of fuel. It's the best for your weapons. And they actually bypassed that lead formation and went all the way to the tail end of the formation. So rather than just disrupt that, where the point of attack was at that lead element where our forces had met their forces, Mm -hmm. and they actually bypassed that and went all the way to the tail end of that enemy formation and devastated that tail end and blocked the road. Mm -hmm. And that allowed for the next 30 hours wave and wave and wave of aircraft to then pick off every other vehicle that had no place to maneuver. By bypassing what seemed to be the most obvious answer, which is that first line, mm-hmm. which they recognized, this is our opportunity to shut this whole system down. And that was the genesis of that, is recognizing this is the area we need to exploit. And we're actually going to take it, we're going to skip the tactical answer here and go all the way to the end of this formation. And that created a route that the enemy couldn't recover from because they had nowhere to go because those guys saw the opportunity to do that uh, at the very beginning of that campaign. Whereas mostly I'd think you go out for hit, hit the first element, come back, do it again. And that gives them all that time to, to, mm-hmm. to, to recalibrate and do something different. Yeah. And especially, and I don't, I don't know too much about that scenario from the air perspective, but from the ground perspective, you would think, well, the lead element is the one that you're most worried about. Right. They're the ones that are closest to friendly forces. We need to go and eliminate them first and we'll go from there. So to, so to bypass that is a, a pretty bold decision to make. Continuing on, for example, during Operation Desert Storm in 1991, the Army's Tiger Brigade was deployed by the 2nd Marine Division as an exploitation force during the division's final attack. The brigade had the advantage over the Iraqis in speed, firepower, and night combat capabilities. With these advantages, the Tiger Brigade sliced deep into the rear of the Iraqi Three Corps and sealed off the vital highway intersections north of al Jara. The result was total disruption in the Iraqi organized defense. The third way to exploit advantage is through pursuit. A pursuit is an offensive tactic designed to cut off or catch a hostile force that has lost cohesion and is attempting to escape in order to destroy it. If the intent is to bring about the final destruction or capture of the enemy forces, then pursuit should be pushed with utmost vigor. It is here that operations turn into routes and overwhelming victories often occur. General Grant's pursuit of General Lee's Confederate Army of Northern Virginia from Petersburg Petersburg to Appomattox in April 1865 is a classic example of pursuit. Here, Grant pushed his forces to their limits in order to prevent Lee's escape. This ultimately led to the capture and surrender of Lee's forces. The Confederate Army's Lieutenant General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson summed up pursuit when he said, strike the enemy and overcome him. Never give up the pursuit as long as your men have the strength to follow. For an enemy routed, if hotly pursued, becomes panic-stricken and can be destroyed by half their number. So you, once you got them on the run, 
Run them down. Run them down. Finishing the enemy. Ultimately, we want to cultivate opportunities into a decisive advantage. Once we do, we make the most of it. Marine Corps tactics call for leaders who are strong finishers. We must have a strong desire to go for the jugular. I'm so thankful they put that in there. Because that's, that's, you know, usually that's sort of like a, like a ruffian comment to make, right? It's usually said in a negative way. Yeah. Like, dude, I can't believe you went for the jugular like yeah, that. The disproportionate response. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. No. We're talking that's the right response. That's what we're going to do here. Go for the jugular. We must be constantly trying to find and create the opportunity to deliver the decisive blow. At the same time, we must not be premature in our actions. Oh, they should call this the dichotomy of leadership. We must not make the decisive move before the conditions are right. Yeah. When you guys talk about the idea of being aggressive, though, you, you described as you use the phrase default aggressive. It doesn't say be aggressive 100% of the time. There are times not to do that. Absolutely. But really what this is talking about is the type of mindset you want to cultivate is that that's going to be my default unless I have to, I want to pull the reins back on my guys at the times to say, no, 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 this is not the time to do it. I don't want to be in a position to say, hey, look, change your default and get aggressive now and start pushing them into that breach. So it, it, that, that is actually right. That's the default. And then there are times I'm going to go, huh, n- yeah. not now. Because there's other things at play here that maybe you don't see and I might see from up here that they're pulling you into that and we don't want to go in that direction. Yep. But the default, actually, I want every one of my guys to be aggressive and I'll pull them back as opposed to, well, I thought the best thing to do was hold off until you told me to go. That's the default that will get you killed is, is not being aggressive. So it doesn't say be aggressive 100% of the time, but your default needs to be in that position. Yeah, and what's, what's the reason that's necessary is because the moment, the split second that it takes to tell someone, okay, now we're gonna turn on our aggressiveness. Window's gone. The window's gone. And counter to that, in the moment that it takes to tell someone, hey, actually, we're not gonna do that, they go, oh, okay, cool. It's not that big of a deal. They didn't miss an opportunity. Yeah. They, they, they started their exploitation, and then they said, oh, we're gonna pull back, fine. No factor. No yep. factor. Yep. One works. The other does not work. Period. (laughs) This ability to finish the enemy once and for all derives from, first from, possessing an aggressive mentality. (laughs) Second, it stems from an understanding of the commander's intent. Third, it stems from a keen situational awareness that helps recognize opportunities when they present themselves and understand when the conditions are right for action. So again, it's not 100% of the time, it's when the conditions are right for action. So those, those are the three things. First, aggressive mentality. Second, understanding the commander's intent. Third, situational awareness. So you understand if the actions are right. Next section, use of the reserve in combat. The reserve is an important tool for exploiting success. The reserve is part of the commander's combat power initially withheld from action in order to influence future action. The reason to create and maintain a reserve is to provide flexibility to deal with the uncertainty, chance, and disorder of war. The reserve is thus a valuable tool for maintaining adaptability. In general, the more uncertain the situation, the larger should be in reserve. Napoleon once said that war is composed of nothing but accidents, and a general should never lose sight of any, everything to enable him to profit from those accidents. These accidents take the form of opportunities and crises. And crises. The reserve is a key tactical tool for dealing with both. The commander should have a purpose in mind for reserve employment and design it to fulfill that purpose. To truly exploit success may warrant assignment of the commander's best subordinate unit or a preponderance of combat power or mobility assets to the reserve. So sometimes your your reserve should be your strongest and most powerful element, whether it's the best or whether it's the, the one with the most combat power. Those commanders who properly organize, task, and equip their reserves are usually the ones with the capability to finish the enemy when the opportunity arises. 
Winston Churchill recognized the value of a reserve when he wrote, it is in the use and withholding of their reserves that great commanders have generally excelled. After all, when once the last reserve has been thrown in, commanders, the commander's part is played. The event must be left to pluck and to the fighting troops. And pluck is like an old term for courage. Basically, once you've put, committed your reserve, you're, you're done. You've made your move. You've made your move. And now you gotta let it go. You gotta you, you 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 don't have much influence over it anymore. And always important to keep that keep that reserve strong. Always important. Financial reserve that's a big one to think about. And we 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 deal with companies and they're weighing out the risk because sometimes it's like we need to go all in right now. Yeah. And when you commit the reserve, that can be the decisive moment. Back to the book. A strong reserve is also a way to retain the initiative. If an advance slows, the reserve can increase momentum. If an advance picks up speed, the commitment of the reserve then can can then create a route. We may use the reserve to expand or or exploit gaps or penetrations. We may commit the reserve to attack in a different location, thus exploiting opportunities for success instead of reinforcing failure. Without a strong reserve, even the most promising opportunities can be lost. A classic example of the use of reserve is the Battle for Tarawa. With the 2nd and 8th Marine Regiments held up on the assault beaches, General Julian Smith decided to land the 6th Marine Regiment, the the Division Reserve, to break the stalemate. The 1st Battalion, 6th Marines, which was task organized as part of the Division Reserve, landed on the western end of the island, passed through the 3rd Battalion, 2nd Marines, and from the flank conducted a swift and violent assault of the Japanese fortifications across the island. Within 48 hours, the Japanese forces were annihilated and the island secured. When you're training the jujitsu, what you know what you consider? What do you consider your reserve, Echo? When you're training jujitsu, what do you mean energy? What? Energy reserve? Or yeah, see, that's what I think of. Yeah, so ath- essentially, athleticism is a reserve, right? Where like yes, that's one reserve, and one reserve you have is energy, right? How yeah. much energy do you have? Oh and yeah, knowing when reserve, to yeah. commit that. Yeah, because let's face it, if you commit your energy. Really early on, yeah, yeah, against a fruitless right. attack, yeah. you're going to run out of energy. You're you're talking about a white belt right now. You're talking about me. That's <laughs> what I know the most about. Is not. I wish I knew. Uh, it's that thirty seconds into it, I'm too tired, yeah. too exhausted. I've overexerted myself. When almost always my coach will, when we'll replay it, there was no reason to do it. There was no <laughs> yeah. thing that I was triggering. Like this is the time to yep. to to apply my exertion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that's what you're talking about. Someone who doesn't know when to when to do that, and when they don't know to do it, they do it at all the wrong times. Yeah, that's that's the way I feel when I roll. I feel like I'm I have a good reserve. Yeah, I feel like I maintain my reserves, and I don't commit them unless it's time. Yeah, huh? Yeah, if you can consciously be aware, and yeah, the earlier on you are, the harder it is for you to control it more than anything. Where, like, yeah, you're. You know, Jocko, your level is like you almost not even consciously can control that. You know, it's like it's almost like you're you're subconsciously triggered to like, okay, you know, like this is maybe this this match or this this training, whatever is heating up. Mm -hmm. So let me maintain the reserves right Mm -hmm. now, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You'll still use your technique. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But when the guy is bringing it, it's kind of like, dang, you got to fight his energy with your yeah. energy you're like okay i'm not going to do that yep. i might take a guard pass or something yep. like that and save it till it till, yeah, till it's ready till it you know yeah man it's true and at the end of the day that's really the the reserve it's the reserve even if you say athleticism or strength or muscling it is your last ditch effort all that takes energy yeah and that's essentially what you're using you're yeah. using your even, strength, even your good using technique your re- takes energy yeah yeah and let's face it if you had unlimited energy yeah, wait. then you would just win. Yeah, just I mean, uh, unless you're going against someone that's just technically vastly superior to you. Yeah, yeah. And when but you're in a battle, in yeah, a battle, you're right. in a yes. battle, you've got one reserve, yeah. and it is that energy. The energy. 
Sometimes we must employ the reserve to deal with some crisis, rendering it temporarily unavailable for commitment elsewhere. In such instances, a reserve should be reconstituted as rapidly as possible. So sometimes you gotta scramble yep. and move and use some energy, and then as soon as you get to a good position, rest. Right. <laughs> We should look for the opportunity to employ the reserve to reinforce success. However, we may employ the reserve. However, we employ we may employ the reserve. We should always think of it as the tool for clinching victory. That's also why you see a guy gets a gets a submission, thinks. Let me rephrase that. A guy thinks he gets a submission, mm-hmm. and expends all of his energy trying to clinch the victory, mm-hmm. expends all of his reserves. You see this in MMA a lot too. Oh, yes, spends sir. all of his reserves, has nothing left. The person gets out of the the possible submission and the game is now, the tide's turn. Just like that. In this respect, Marshal Falk, who is a French general, he was actually the supreme allied commander in World War I leading troops to victory at the at the Marne, which I don't know, man. Like, I, like, every time I read like the background of a general or of someone that's getting quoted, I'm always like, yeah, there you go. But when you were the in charge of all allies in World War I, no offense, um, I'm not super, I'm not super stoked on what you have to say. Cause, cause, yeah. And he, anyways, he wrote that the reserve is a club. Prepared, organized, reserved, carefully maintained with a view to carrying out one act of battle from which a result is expected, the decisive attack. It is generally, and then that's the end of his quote, which I'm glad I said I wasn't too impressed with him because I wasn't impressed with that quote. Is that just my own bias? Do I hate World War One that much? No, <laughs> it's because... All the other things we've talked about in the last four podcasts about requirements to be successful in combat were almost all missing. Yeah, the creativity, all those things that you talked about, the human wave advancement to steal seventy-five yards from the enemy only to give it up at sunset, was none of those things. So I had the exact same response in my mind. Well, that quote's over. It is generally through offensive action, even in the defense, that we achieve decisive results. Since the Reserve represents our bid to achieve a favorable decision or to prevent an unfavorable one. It often becomes the main effort once committed and should be supported by all other elements of force. Along with the tangible assets used as a reserve, the prudent commander must also be aware of and plan for the intangible factors that impact on combat power and its sustainment. Intangible factors include fatigue, that's number one. I don't, it doesn't say this is in order, but that's number one. And by the way, that's what we've been talking about. Fatigue. We've been talking about energy, but the opposite of energy is fatigue. So number one, fatigue. Number two, leadership quality. No surprise. Number three, proficiency. Number four, morale. Number five, teamwork. Number six, equipment maintenance. We build reserves also by reserving aviation sortie rates or numbers withholding unique or low density munitions or holding critical supplies such as fuel or petroleum, oils and lubricants for a specific goal. We consider these intangible factors when creating and tasking the reserve as we do in all assignments of task. Yeah, and this is, again, this is what businesses have to think about all the time because you do not know what the market is gonna do. I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been doing this for. You don't know what the market's going to do. You can you have good suspicions. That's great. You don't know. Big difference. Yeah. It's actually telling you to be <clears throat> extremely disciplined. They use the term low density. That just means something you don't have a lot of. You know, low density, high demand items in the military are these really unique capabilities, different types of aircraft and weapons, but you don't have a lot of them. So you have to be really disciplined with their use. So when the time is actually right to use them, they're available to you to use them. Uh, incredible concept. <laughs> these concepts apply not only to units initially designated as the reserve, but also to any unit since any unit can be shifted or recommitted as the reserve. Thus, a commander must always be mentally prepared to redesignate roles of units and to create 
and use reserves as the situation requires. And you know what? You know what's interesting is we see this. We see these these businesses that end up eating other businesses. Is that the right word? Acquiring, I guess. But but basically, when you get a business that maintains a solid reserve, when opportunity reveals itself, they're there to cash in yeah. and buy other companies and take them over. And then they come out of that. You know, if you don't maintain reserve, the opportunity is there, and you can't exploit it. Same thing with your leadership capital, right? Same thing with you as a leader. If you sit there and you expend all your leadership reserve, all your leadership capital, you don't leave any reserve, you have no more, for lack of a better word, you have no more favors to ask. Yeah. Does you, as a leader, should you be asking favors? Yeah, you are asking for favors. That's what, every time you ask a subordinate to do something, you're asking for a favor. That's what you're asking. You're asking them to put their trust in you to do this thing that you want. That's a favor. And if you expend all your leadership capital and you have no more favors to ask when the time is needed yeah. and you've expended those reserves, you're not going to be followed anymore. That's why relationships are so critical to all this. I mean, that's how you build up your, that's your leadership reserve. That's your capital. That's your reserve force is how strong those relationships are. So when the time is right, you can cash in on that. Not that you cash in on them and, and use them as some sort of expendable resources, that you actually leverage that relationship and that recognition that you need to build that now. You don't know when you're going to need it, but you're going to need it. And I say this, answer the question all the time with companies about needing to, the crisis that you're dealing with now, mm -hmm. that's not, you can't start there. And if you haven't built it up, the reality is, is there's really no answer I can give you. Because if you don't have anything in the reserves, there's very little you can do to leverage to try to solve this problem. What you need to do is think about it well in advance. And the strengths of those relationships from you contributing to them is how you have something left in reserve when you need it. People want to know what to do. I get this all the time. I'm flying against another aircraft. He's directly behind me at 1,000 feet, and he's about to shoot his gun at me. What do I do? I'm like, you know what? Mm -hmm. There's not, a, I know I'm a top gun instructor here, but I don't have a lot of good answers for you. Yeah. You have nothing left available to, to, to utilize here to defend yourself against this situation. The answer is you got to go back to the beginning, uh, which you can't do. And people want the solution then, and the solution is you, you got to go back. You got to build capital in other ways before you get to that position. Yeah, that's like the how do you escape the rear naked choke? Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, is it possible? Sure. The other person can make a mistake. You could you could do something. But the bottom line is you get someone gets a legit rear naked choke on you or someone gets you in the triangle. There's a, there's a way to get out. It's called submitting. <laughs> this is the conclusion of this chapter. Most decisive victories do not result from the initial action but from quickly and aggressively exploiting the opportunities created by that action. We may find any number of ways to exploit tactical opportunity, but they all have the same object, to increase leverage until we, find, until we have the final opportunity to decide the issue once and for all in our favor. A goal in Marine Corps tactics is not merely to gain advantage, but to boldly and ruthlessly exploit that advantage to achieve final victory. And now we will get to the eighth and final chapter of Marine Corps tactics. And it is called, you might think that these guys sitting around in a room writing doctrine would come up with more doctrinally, doctrine sounding things, things that, Things that they would come up with at, uh, at, in, the, in the halls of academia, right? You might think that. What do they call chapter eight? They call it making it happen. <laughs> that passes muster. So making it happen, chapter eight. Here's the quotes it starts off with. Nine tenths of tactics are certain and taught in books, but the irrational tenth is like the kingfisher flashing across the pool, and that is the test of generals. It can only be ensured by instinct, sharpened by thought, practicing the stroke so often that, the, that at the crisis, it is as natural as a reflex. And that's by T.E. Lawrence. 
Lawrence of Arabia. Nine tenths of tactics are certain. I lo- the irrational tenth. There's a tenth of tactics that are irrational. And this is where you become. This is why if you can't tap into that creativity, if you can't train that creativity in your brain, that's why you're not going to be successful. Well, I shouldn't say that. You're not going to be eminently successful. Yeah. You'll be somewhat successful. You'll be reliable. And that's admirable. It's good to be reliable. But if you want to go next level, you need to be able to be a little bit irrational at times. You need to be able to handle the irrational. And the next quote is, it cannot be too often repeated that in modern war, and especially in modern naval war, the chief factor in achieving triumph is what has been done in the way of thorough preparation and training before the beginning of the war. Which is, which is what you were talking about, Dave. Like, why are you in that position? And that's by, by the way, that's Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, President Theodore Roosevelt, Rough Rider Theodore Roosevelt, Medal of Honor recipient Theodore Roosevelt, who, by the way, his son, Teddy Roosevelt Jr., Medal of Honor recipient, D-Day. You know how old he was at D-Day? You know how old Teddy Young Jr. was on D-Day? When he was present on the beach in Normandy? How old? 56 years old. 56 years old, demanded that he be allowed to lead his men into that situation. And, and he was not... He was not like a, st- a strong, healthy uh, 56 years old. You want to know why he wasn't strong and healthy at the age of 56? Because he was still having problems, health, major health problems, from the wounds that he suffered in World War I. So there you go. There's the quotes. These are quotes we listen to. <laughs> And go into the book. Reading and understanding the ideas in this publication are the initial steps on the road to tactical excellence. Reading and understanding. Boy, they throw those words out there real easy, don't they? Reading and understanding. As if it's like if you read, you understand. That is not true. Reading and understanding have almost nothing to do with each other. (laughs) Reading and understanding. That should be capitalized and italicized and in a different font. Reading and understanding the ideas in this publication are the initial steps, that's just the initial steps, on the road to tactical excellence. The primary way a Marine leader becomes an able tactician is through training and education, both of which are firmly rooted in doctrine. Doctrine establishes the philosophy and the practical framework for how we fight. Education develops the understanding, creativity, military judgment, and the background essential for effective battlefield leadership. There is a lot to learn. Training follows doctrine and develops the tactical and technical proficiency that underlies all successful military action. Individual and group exercises serve to integrate training and education producing a whole that is greater than the sum of its parts. The lessons learned from training and operational experience then modify doctrine. Doctrine, next section, doctrine. Doctrine establishes the fundamental beliefs of the Marine Corps on the subject of war and how we practice our profession. Doctrine establishes a particular way of thinking about war and our way of fighting, a philosophy for leading Marines in combat, a mandate for professionalism, and a common language. That is important. That's one of the things when we work with companies, the common language part. These companies know that they're making mistakes. They don't know how do I properly identify what their mistakes are or what their issues are until we come in and we start teaching them about cover and move, about simple, about prioritized and execute, about decentralized command, about default aggressive. They, 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 are, they know there's a problem, but they can't put their finger on it. And then once, they, once we come and they can put their finger on it and then they can talk about it in a common language, mm-hmm. that's like the initial foothold in victory 
is actually being able to communicate with each other about what the damn problem is. Doctrinal development benefits from our collective experience and distills its lessons to further education and training. Our doctrine within the Marine Corps begins with the philosophy contained in Marine Corps Doctrinal Publication 1, which is called Warfighting, which we covered on this podcast early on. That was one of the earliest ones I covered, and that's the reason. Because that one is a good, solid foundation, a good, solid philosophy for doctrine, for warfighting. This publication underlies, this philosophy underlies publications in the Marine Corps Warfighting Publication Series that contain tactics, techniques, and procedures for specific functions. The body of thought helps form Marine tacticians through its implementation in education and training. Now they have this little diagram, and there's been some other diagrams which I didn't really try to explain too much because you can get the book, it's free, it's a PDF. But this one has, it has this loop. The loop has education, it has training, it has operational employment, it has doctrine, and they all, so you you get educated, you go train, you employ operationally, that operational employment becomes doctrine, the doctrine is what we teach on. So, so there's the doctrinal development cycle. And what I added into this little thing is that in between each of those steps, you adapt, you assess, and you adjust. So that's what's happening. You educate, and as you educate, then you go train. Well, when you train, you're gonna make adaptations, you're gonna make assessments, you're gonna make adjustments. Then when you deploy and employ, you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna assess where you're at, what worked, what didn't, you're gonna make adaptations, then you're gonna put that in the doctrine. With the doctrine, you're gonna take that and educate people, and you're gonna continually assess and adapt and adjust what you're, what you're teaching and what you're training on. Next section, education. While combat provides the most instructive lessons on (laughs) decision-making, that's an understatement of the year. (laughs) While combat provides the most instructive lessons on decision-making, tactical leaders cannot wait for war to begin their education. We must be competent in our profession before our skills are called upon. The lives of our Marines depend on it. Our education and tactics must develop three qualities within all tactical leaders. The first quality is creative ability. Tactical leaders must be encouraged to devise and pursue unique approaches to military problems. No rules govern ingenuity. See now, this is not what people expect. We did the the chapter on discipline and this seems to be completely counter to that. That's why there's a dichotomy here. But the number one quality to develop is creative ability. And there's no rules that govern ingenuity. The line separating boldness from foolhardiness is drawn by the hand of practical experience. That said, an education in tactics must possess an element of rigor. Too often, tactical discussions lack an in-depth analysis of cause and effect. The tactically proficient leader must learn how to analyze solutions to tactical problems. Lacking such a rigorous analysis, the tactician will not learn from experience nor exercise creative ability. This applies to everything, by the way. It applies to everything. Anything that you're trying to learn, you, you, should, you, should, you should focus on this attitude. Of, of really truly doing in-depth analysis and, and making sure that you're not just learning how to apply the techniques as they were taught, but how to apply them as they were not taught creatively. The second quality is military judgment, which includes the skills for gaining situational awareness and acting decisively. The tactician must readily recognize the critical factors in any situation, enemy capabilities, weather, terrain, characteristics, and the condition of our own forces, to mention just a few. Marine leaders must be able to cut to the heart of a situation by identifying its important elements, developing a sound plan, and making clear decisions. Our educational approach should emphasize the ability to understand the mission, issue clear intent, and determine the main effort. Now, for all the first lieutenants at the basic school, 
and all the other young officers and NCOs that are out there. The, when, when they talk about the tactician must readily recognize the critical factors in any situation, I promise you that if you want to be able to do that, what you need to learn how to do is to detach from the situation is to take a step back when there's enemy capabilities that you have to understand, when there's terrain, when there's, when there's maneuvering elements that you need to understand and recognize. You will not be able to do that if you are staring down your ACOG or staring down your iron sights or you've got your helmet pressed up against your radar in an F-18. You will not see what you need to see. So... Learn to detach. Get your head on a swivel. Take a step back. This will make you infinitely better, infinitely better than the same you if you're sucked into your weapon system. The the sooner you learn the ability to do that, the amount of leadership advantage you have by being able to do that in the most difficult situations is, it's, I don't have the words. It's it's not even fair. It's it's not, that's right. (laughs) It's not even fair. You will be head and shoulders. And the reason I, I, I say that with a little funny tone is because I remember I had a guy that was in TU Bruiser and he was a platoon commander and I was putting him through training and it was like some scenario unfolding and I was like, I was like, bro, come here. I'm like, just, just come with me over here. Over here was like six inches away. And I'm like, look around. And it was so obvious. I'm like, hey man, if you can be one inch, if you can be one inch at altitude above everyone else, you can see, you can see a thousand times more what they can see. A thousand times more. So if you want to be able to have that situational awareness, you have to learn how to detach. The third quality is moral courage. Moral courage is the ability to make and carry out the decision regardless of personal cost. It is different from and rarer than physical courage. The cost of physical courage may be injury or death, whereas the cost of moral courage may be the loss of friends, popularity, prestige, or career opportunities. The burden of conflicting responsibilities in combat, responsibility for lives of subordinates, support for peers, loyalty to superiors, and duty to nation can be heavy. Our educational efforts should lead potential leaders to work through the proper resolution of such such conflicts in peacetime. Leaders often need to make morally correct decisions in combat, but there will rarely be time for deep moral or ethical contemplation on the battlefield. Now, what's interesting about this is, first of all, they say it's rarer than physical courage. And then it says the cost of physical courage may be injury or death. To, to most people, that sounds like the, the worst thing is possible. But then they're saying, but whereas the cost of moral courage may be loss of friends, popularity, prestige, and this is the one I find most interesting, or career opportunities. So what they are saying right there, I mean, obviously, if my boss wants me to make a certain, a, a, a correct moral decision, he's gonna promote me. But what they're saying in that statement right there, that there are times when you will be making decisions that are morally correct that will actually hurt your career. That's the statement. Or you will be at risk of hurting your career. I can think of a thousand examples of this right off the top of my head from being in SEAL platoons. You know, because you, you, you want, what happens to leaders sometimes in a SEAL platoon is they don't want it, they're insecure about their leadership and there's something going on that they don't feel comfortable about, but they don't have the moral courage to say anything. And part of that is because, hey, they, they say, oh, this, is, this shouldn't be happening. And as soon as they say that, they're drawing a spotlight on themselves 
and they're not really sure about themselves and all of a sudden they feel like if their boss is gonna look at them like they don't know how to lead their men and now I'm not gonna get promoted. Like that whole thing unwinds. You know, Leif and I were talking yesterday and you know, he, he was like, hey, you told me, I was, he was saying that I told him like if you don't do this, you're failing as a leader. And, and what he realized was much of what Leif Babin had in his head was correct, but he just didn't really have the confidence yet to say, to, 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 to implement it, you know, to implement it until I was like, hey man, if you allow this to happen, that, that's actually you being a bad leader. Whether it was, you know, and I'm just talking about anything, any, anything that you dis, you, you know what's right, you know what's wrong, or at least you have a strong suspicion, okay, you know what, this doesn't seem right to me. But I'm not really convicted of it, so I'm just not gonna say anything. I'll just let it, kind of let it go. And that is wrong. And that's what takes this moral courage to step up when you're gonna be unpopular, when you're gonna be the guy that says, hey, guess what, we're not gonna do that. And in the teams, a lot of it is, oh, you're, you're a pussy. You're a wimp if you don't, if, oh, you just need to get on board with what we're doing here. It's like, no, actually I don't. We're, we're actually gonna do what the right thing is here legally. Most of the catastrophic events that I saw in my career weren't on the battlefield, weren't getting beat in combat or outmaneuvered by an enemy. Most of the catastrophic events were teams squadrons, what have you, that had leaders that allowed those things to happen and build over time because they were afraid to get involved. And eventually something catastrophic would happen inside that team that ironically ended up being a reflection of their leadership anyway. So the thing that they were most afraid of was what culminated anyway as a reflection of their leadership, allowing those questionable ethical behaviors, those questionable ways that we allow our Marines to behave out in town or, or even in, in the space out of a fear of doing what seems to be unpopular or mm. being what you just described, those are the ones when I saw squadrons suffer, you talked about SEAL platoons getting disbanded, things like that. It wasn't because they were getting beat at the point of friction in, in combat. It was that things that happened inside the organization that leadership tolerated and ended up leading to what they were afraid of in the first place anyway, which was that they were viewed upon as a leader who couldn't lead their team. And the greatest risk that I saw in leadership in the Marine Corps was allowing the people around you to behave in ways that you knew were wrong. But the fear of looking unpo or being unpopular by getting involved in those things because they weren't cool or whatever they were, were the undoing of the more, more leaders in the Marine Corps than anything they ever did in an airplane or as a, as a commander in some sort of tactical situation. So I went through this. And to be quite honest with you, I cheated. I pulled a maneuver on my troops that allowed me to come at this from an angle that they could not argue with. And when I used to teach the young officers, I called this the trump card. The trump card, I had the trump card in my back pocket. If you wanted to argue with me, that you wanted to do this thing or do this behavior or, be, or, or act in a certain way. You wanted to do that. And what you were saying was, hey, Jocko, you're kind of a pussy because you don't wanna do this or you're not gonna allow this or you don't want us to, to, to act in that, in that way. My trump card was real simple and real straightforward and it won 100% of the time, it was the ace of spades. And what I would say to guys is, so what you're saying, what you're saying is you would rather do this behavior and risk getting in trouble and not go to war, not go to combat, because you'd rather do this behavior. If that's where you're at, fuck you. I don't want you on my team. I don't even wanna be associated with you. I'm here to go to war. I waited my whole life to go to war. That's what I was born to do. And to have you put that possibility at risk because of because you wanna do some behavior one night, one little thing that you wanna do, and you're talking to me like I'm a bitch, you're a bitch. Don't, don't even bring that up to me again. That was my trump card. I got a text the other day 
from one of the guys that used to work for me. And he said, he, he said, hey, I was thinking about what you told us about behavior. And he, and he sent this little quote to me. I told him, I said, if any of you do anything that prevents us from going to war, I will never forgive you and I will hate you forever. <laughs> and I laughed, you know, because I don't remember everything that I said. But that right there, that's to me is the ultimate trump card. Oh, you'd rather you'd rather go out and get drunk than go and fight Al Qaeda. That's what you'd rather do. Yeah. That's what you're telling me right now. And who can argue with that? You can't argue with that. And and you know what? Guys wouldn't argue with that. The team guys, you know what they want to do? They want to fight and go to war. Okay, are there some? Is there a small percent? Of course that don't really want to do that. But the guys that were with me, that's what they wanted to do. So that right there is the trump card. And it's the truth. The, the, it's the absolute truth. I don't care about anything else. There's enemy, there's bad guys, there's, there's a, a group of human beings on this planet that want to destroy our way of life, and I, w- I have the opportunity to go and hunt them down and kill them, and you're going to take that away, or you're going to put that in any kind of risk? Jeopardy. Not happening. Not happening. Moral courage. Next section. An effective leader willingly takes on the risks which come with military responsibilities. In that light, the greatest failing of a leader is a failure to lead. Two steadfast rules apply. First, in situations clearly requiring independent decisions, a leader has the solemn duty to make them. Whether the subsequent action succeeds or fails, the leader has made an honorable effort. The broad exercise of initiative by all Marines will likely carry the battle in spite of individual errors. So you make a call. And look, if you mess up a little bit, don't worry. There's 250 other Marines that are making decisions and they're gonna, the majority of those decisions yeah. are gonna be okay. Right. We got you. Second, inaction and omission based on a failure of moral courage are much worse than any judgment error reflecting a sincere effort to act. So not doing anything is like the mortal sin. Errors resulting from such moral failings lead not only to tactical setbacks, but to the breakdown of faith in the chain of command. Proper training, education, and concerned leadership are the keys to instilling the qualities of creative ability, military judgment, and moral courage in the minds of all Marines. Next section, training. Good tactics depend upon sound technical skills. These are the techniques and procedures which enable us to move, shoot, and communicate. I made a little note here. Move, shoot, and communicate. In the team, is that way you always hear it? I hear it backwards. Right, you hear shoot, Shoot, move, and communicate, communicate, right? I believe that is correct. Marine Corps, please adjust this. (laughs) We need to shoot first. We need to put down cover fire so so we can can move. move. We're not gonna move, shoot, and communicate. We're gonna shoot, move, and communicate. That's what we say in the teams. I'm, sh- I'm pretty sure that's what the Marine Corps <laughs> means as well. We achieve technical competence through training. We build skills through repetition. Training also instills confidence in weapons and equipment. It develops the specialized skills essential to functioning in combat. One of the ultimate aims of training is speed. Essential to speed is the requirement for accuracy. Speed without accuracy may be counterproductive and causes more damage than, in- than inaction. Whether Marines compute firing data, practice rifle marksmanship or or weapons gunnery, rearm and refuel aircraft, repair vehicles, stock or transport supplies, or communicate information, the speed and accuracy of their actions determine the tempo of the overall force. 
Training develops the proficiency which enables this effective combination of speed and accuracy. All the things you're talking about here, this is this is really the first time this tactics gets into tactical components of the things these individual Marines are supposed to do. But something this that was mentioned earlier that, that set the stage on this was what this pulls from. The first doctrinal pub in the Marine Corps is Pub 1, 1 TAC 1, mm-hmm. is called war fighting. And that is the unifying thing that ties every Marine together is the understanding that you, and it's really all the things you've just been talking about, you are here as a war fighter. First of all, why would you do anything? Why would you expend any energy or take any action to do anything that could potentially undermine your ability to do that? Whether it's getting drunk on a Friday night because it's it's what the dudes are doing, what the bros are doing, to do anything that would undermine, but it's also the common belief system that we all have that that's what we do. We are here to fight wars, period. And every single thing I'm going to do, whether it's putting gas in an airplane, pulling the trigger, or or memorizing how the logistics train, whatever it is, you are here to be a war fighter. And the only way any of this works is that common belief that all Marines have that that's why you're here and that's what you do and it guides every single thing you do but without that first understanding of what it is that we are none of this other stuff works you can't get to pub 2 and pub 3 and pub 6 if you don't understand what it is that we are and that's I think that's why they were describing all this other thing pulls from that overriding understanding of what you are and now what war fighting Tactically, it could take a thousand different forms. There's a thousand different things tactically you can do to be a warfighter. I just think it's how many organizations we work at where what they do is the thing that they do. I do logistics, I do mark, but they don't actually understand what they are. And the tactical application of what you do, unless you understand what that fits into, it doesn't, doesn't do anything in the end. I think the idea of war fighting being what we do with sort of driving everything is the coolest, it's the coolest thing. Yeah, and it's one of those things, as you just said, if that thread gets lost by yeah. someone that's out working on vehicles, if that thread gets lost by someone that's delivering fuel, if that thread gets lost by someone that is computing firing data, then the whole thing can All fall it. apart. Yeah. And that's the same in any organization. If we lose track of the underlying theme and thread of what it is we are trying to do, we can fall apart. And who's responsible for making sure that happens? That 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 doesn't happen, that we understand what our underlying core mission is? That's us as leaders. Leaders. Continuing. Small unit training should focus on proficiency in such techniques and procedures as immediate action drills, battle drills, and unit standard operating procedures. Practicing to reach technical proficiency applies to all types of units, whether a section of aircraft executing air combat maneuvers, a maintenance contact team repairing a vehicle under fire, an artillery gun team conducting displacement drills, or a rifle squad conducting an in-stride beach breach of an obstacle. We develop and refine these measures so that units gain and maintain the speed and accuracy essential for success in battle. Staffs, like units and individual leaders, must train to increase speed and accuracy. Staffs increase speed by accomplishing three things. First, by obtaining and organizing information to help the commander and themselves understand the situation. Boy, this is like every, this should be printed on the walls of every staff organization in the US military. Second, by understanding the commander's decision and court decision and coordinating efforts to focus combat power to achieve the commander's goal. And third, by monitoring events, maintaining situational awareness, and anticipating and, 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 adapt to, and adapting to changes. As staffs train, they increase accuracy by becoming more proficient both in their respective areas and in functioning as a team. 
That's what the staffs are trying to do. And notice that if you're in a staff, you better know what the commander's goal is. You better understand what that intent is. Because if you don't understand what that intent is, if you don't understand that goal is, you are completely lost. And if you're a commander and there's any doubt in your military mind whatsoever that your staff doesn't know what your intent is and what your goal is, you better make it crystal clear. Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, Rommel knew the value of speed and accuracy for his staff when he wrote, a commander must accustom his staff to a high tempo from the outset and continuously keep them up to it. If he once allows himself to be satisfied with norms or anything less than an all-out effort, he gives up the race from the starting post and will sooner or later be taught a bitter lesson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Allow yourself to be satisfied with the norms. Allowing anything less than an all-out effort. You give up the race from the starting post. That's what I'm talking about. Now, can we burn people out? Absolutely. Yes. Can we burn ourselves out? Absolutely. So... You, what you have to know, you, what you have to learn, and what you have to understand is you have to understand and learn when you're going to conserve energy and when you're going to go on the attack. You know, that's, that's Rommel talking, and, and that sounds cool. But trust me, and I've seen it, and, we, and I know you've seen it in the military, plenty of commanders that they lose touch with their people and they just burn them out. And they have horrible command climates and, and more important, they're, they become ineffective at executing their mission. Yeah. That's the real problem. Continuing, the speed and efficiency of a unit de depend not only on the technical proficiency of its individual members, but also in large part upon its cohesiveness. Such cohesion requires both personal personnel stability and solid leadership. Training should also prepare Marines for the uniquely physical nature of combat, living and caring for themselves in a Spartan environment, confronting the natural elements, and experiencing the discomfort of being hungry, thirsty, and tired are as essential in preparing for combat duty as any skills training. The point is not to train individuals on how to be miserable, but rather on how to be effective when miserable or exhausted. Yeah, think about that for a second. We're not gonna do this so we can survive these difficult environments. We're gonna do this so we can thrive and take advantage of these situations. The, the cold in Korea, we're not gonna train to, for that just so we can survive the cold. We're actually gonna use it to destroy our enemies. You talked about a little bit earlier about Leaders that will just, they'll lose sight of what they're trying to do and, and what they'll do, they'll just push really hard. And it's not that they're pushing harder than their other counterparts, it's that they don't understand when and why they're pushing hard. They don't know when they should build up their reserves and when to deploy. So they just go hard because they know going hard, we should go hard. Mm -hmm. And it isn't that they're going harder and they burn them out, it's that there's no connection to why they're going hard to what they're actually gonna try to accomplish in, in that training and that disconnect of, why they're doing what they're doing versus what they're doing. And I've been in units where the leader just, we just go hard. And a lot of people are like, what the hell are we doing? And nobody knows. And those units will fall apart mm -hmm. before they actually exceed their physical capacity to do things. Whereas other units can actually, you can actually go harder mm -hmm. if they understand why. So that thing you really want to do, if you can make the connection to the reason they're doing it, you can go as hard as you want. And it's not the going hard that burns the units out. It's that having no idea why they're going hard or when they should go hard. Those are the units that, that burn out. Here's where you can run into a problem with this attitude of Rommel's of, hey, we're just going to go hard 100% all the time. You don't know, you're not, you're, you're, you're utilizing your reserves out of the gate. That's what you're doing. Yep. And so that's a problem. And what the, the, the problem is where, where a leader is even more inaccurate in their assessments than they think is that it's the, it's the idea that I've talked about of the, the guy that's leading PT. And when you're leading PT, PT's kind of fun. Because when I'm leading PT, guess what we're doing? We're doing pull-ups. Because I'm good at pull-ups. 
right? That's what we're doing. And so we're gonna do a ton of pull-ups and if you're not good at pull-ups, PT sucks for you. And by the way, I didn't tell you when we were gonna stop. I didn't tell you how many we're doing. I'm just like, hey, we're doing pull-ups. You should be happy because I'm happy. And so you miss you miscalculate how much the guys can actually take. And there's a decent chance that they can't take as much as you because they're not leading it. That's why when you put subordinate leaders in charge, it allows you to more closely and accurately judge how much they can actually take. And by the way, they'll push harder if they're running it. That's the thing. They'll actually go harder. They'll give you more if you let them run with it. If you think you're gonna lead from the front and, and whip them to keep up with you, you're wrong. You will not get the same mileage out of them as you will if you say, hey, you take this and run with it. So be careful there, young First Lieutenant Rommel out there. Back to the book. Likewise, training should enable us to take appropriate action in any environment and at any time. This readiness includes operating during inclement weather and periods of limited visibility. We must make terrain, weather, and darkness our allies if we are to gain advantage and deliver decisive force at a time and place of our choosing. We can neither anticipate nor appreciate the inherent friction that these natural factors produce unless we experience them. Next section, training and educational methods. That's such a, that's here, that's boring title number one. That's the only, that's the first boring subsection we've got. Training and educational methods. Okay, I don't know if we expect a little bit higher standards. There is no single best approach to developing tactical proficiency. However, any approach should be adaptable to all echelons and grades. The environment should be one that is challenging and conducive to creative thinking. Like all preparation for war, training should reflect the rigors of that environment. The following examples may provide some tools for developing tactical proficiency in Marines. Number one, professional reading and historical study. Because of the relative infrequency of actual combat experiences in most military leaders' careers, Marines must seek to expand their understanding through other less direct means. The study of military history is critical to developing to developing judgment and insight. It enables us to see how successful commanders have thought through and fought through the situations they faced. Not many people can do it instinctively. Few possess the rare native ability to think militarily. Even those few can enhance their abilities through study and practice. What did General Mattis say about this? I was thinking the whole time thinking of Mattis. All I was thinking about in the last two minutes was Mattis. Yeah. And he said, he said that every situation he saw, yeah, I'd seen it before. Yeah, he wasn't afraid of any situation because he had prepared for it. That's right, that whole time, Mattis. Just his, his approach to personal, it. His personal library of 5,000 books. And you you take 5,000. And and I imagine that when Mattis reads them, he's reading them with this incredible depth. Yeah, not as a homework assignment. Yeah, it's yeah. not a homework assignment. He's not 21-year-old First Lieutenant David R. Burke saying, okay, well, I gotta read this before I can go grab a beer with the boys. What are my enabling learning objectives so I can write (laughs) them down real quick so I can move on to something? Yeah, no, he's reading that with the level of depth and understanding that he, he, not just that, but he puts them all together. He he wasn't afraid of any situation because he had prepared for every possible situation that was out there through study of history, because guess what? This stuff has all happened at least one other time before, maybe twice. You know what I've admitted to um, a couple times in the recent past? and you've been with me when I've admitted to it, there's nothing that I like more than something that I didn't expect or that seems problematic or chaotic. Uh, that's what I want. Like that's, that's, when I, that's, when my, that's when my adrenaline just gets a little bit of a release. Because when I've seen it 90 million times, it's like, cool, I'm down. Like, we'll, we'll handle this problem. But man, I like it when something comes at me that I'm not expecting. I love that, I've loved that for a long time. And part of the reason is because it's just an experience, once again, it's, it's, an, it's an opportunity to put some of that creative muscle to work. And that's fun. 
continuing on, historical studies provide the most readily available source of indirect experience in our profession. These studies describe the leadership considerations, the horrors of war, the sacrifices endured, the, the commitment involved, the resources required, and much more, as if that's not enough, and much more. These studies include biographies and autobiographies of military figures, books on specific battles, wars, and military institutions, unit histories, after action reports, films, and documentaries. Group discussions help to expand the insights into leadership and battle that we have gained through individual study. And this is a solid 98% of what this podcast is. (laughs) Biographies, autobiographies, books on specific battles, wars, military institutions, that's what we do here. And like Liddell Hart said, when you study about war, you're gonna learn about life. That's why that's why so many people listen to this podcast that aren't first lieutenants yeah. or colonels or generals. They listen because they go, oh yeah, I can take that same theory and apply it to my business, to my family, to my life. Professional readings and study are not solely the responsibility of military schools. Individuals cannot afford to wait for attendance at a military school to begin a course of self-directed study. Military professionalism demands that individuals and units find time to increase their professional knowledge through professional reading, professional military education classes, and individual study. It's on you. No, you cannot wait for your battalion, your regiment, your squadron to train you. You cannot wait for that. And if you wait for that, you are just wasting so much opportunity to be so much better at this job. Tactical exercises, tactics, tactical success evolves from the synthesis of training and education, the creative application of technical skills based on sound judgment. Exercises enable leaders to practice decision-making and individuals, staffs, and units to practice perfect collective skills. Exercises also serve to test and improve tactics, techniques, and procedures, immediate actions, battle drills, and combat standard operating procedures. And by the way, I've been changing, sta- it keeps saying standing operating. You're just saying standard? I'm saying standard. Rewrite this thing. <laughs> An exercise should serve as a unit's internal assessment of the quality of its training and education and not as grading criteria for higher commands. Oh, that's a nice little thing. We're not grading you for higher commands. We actually just want you to learn. Like, you know those schools where they say, well, you're not gonna get graded here, and it sounds super lame, and it was like, oh, that's, well, think about if you if you said, look, what, what I really want you to do here is learn, and I remember saying that when I was running training, I'd be like, listen, man, I just want you to be ready for combat. That's what I want. I'm, I'm not looking to, to, to write you up or anything. I just want you to be ready for combat, bro. That's what I want. Like, that could have been a good introduction to Lieutenant Dave Burke. He's like, listen, don't worry about where you're gonna break out in this class. What I want you to do is learn and understand what we're saying yeah. to you. It's I, hard to do that. It's hard it's to do so that. It's so hard to do that. I <laughs> think of how many things that I gaffed off early in my career simply because I didn't understand that it was gonna make me better. I just didn't make the connection in my mind that doing this, not the motions, but actually listening and learning to whatever it is that they were teaching me would make me better and more successful. If you told me that there was a, it was a competitive thing, there was a ranking and a grading and a measurement that you were gonna get, I'm all in, man. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm all in, <laughs> why wouldn't I? But the number of things that I was, I just, and I know how many young leaders are out there listening to this, not just in the military, in the business world too, young leaders are listening to this. I ignored so many early in my career. It just took me a while to figure that, what you just described, I just didn't understand it. And I wish I could go back and tell Second Lieutenant Burke, just pay attention. Yeah. Just pay attention, this is gonna pay dividends. You're gonna be able to cash in on this down the road and your peers are gonna wonder what the hell is going on with you because you're gonna be so far out in front of where they are if you just pay attention to this stuff. 
one of the things that you can do to make that happen, in my opinion, is you you actually have to try and put yourself into the scenario that you're being that you're being taught, that you're reading. And I'll tell you, you can hear it. When when I'm when I'm reading when I'm reading with the old breed, man, my brain is there. It is there. When I'm reading One Soldier's War, when I'm reading the coldest, colder than hell, when I'm reading Excursion in Hell, my brain, my mind is there. I'm putting myself right there. That's what I'm doing. When you get taught something, when you hear something, put yourself there. Put it into, put it into your world and put yourself into that world. Being able to do that, the earlier you can start doing that, the better comprehension you will receive from whatever it is that is being bestowed upon you. And that that's, it's hard to do. It's hard to do. And you know, I'll go talk to the young, the young seals. And nowadays, I mean, oh, you can see the kids that are listening because they are absorbing yeah. and they are in it. You can see it in their on their face. And there'll be a couple there'll be a couple that are they're just not there. They're like, "Oh, I you know, I have to listen to another person talk right now." Yeah. And there'll be a that's usually a pretty small number. Yep. But the but then the guys that are just they're they're absorbing what you're saying. You it's like they're gaining actual experience. Okay, is it actual experience? No. It's like they're gaining s- such a closer approximation of experience than the person that's sitting there going, oh, I got I to gotta take notes so I can get g- do good on the quiz. It's because they've made the connection. And I remember avoiding stuff like this because I don't have the time for it. If you actually make the connection, think of how much faster it goes and how much easier it is to go through it when you actually make that connection to you and what it is you're trying to learn. It's easy. <laughs> and the avoidance of that and, and the and the resistance to doing it is the thing that actually makes it more difficult than it needs to be. And, and that's that's what I did. I was like, what am I going to get from this? And I just resisted. And when I'm and I remember even in college, spending a couple years in college, like, am I going to do all this work? What the hell am I going to do all this work for? When I figured out that doing what I learned from doing the work and how much better it made me, the work was ten times easier. Uh, making that connection, putting yourself inside of that. And, and look, these books are actually, some of these books are really good. <laughs> I'm missing some really good learning that are really well written. Yeah. With the Old Breed was the one, that was the trigger for me early in my career. Mm. I wasn't, I was probably a junior captain when I was like a young captain. So probably maybe four years in the Marine Corps when I read mm. that. That was one of the first big light bulbs for me was that book. Yeah. Sledge and just holy cow. Just reading that book. That was one that turned me back into paying it. That's got me on that that path. And I don't get me wrong, there are times that I've veered off that. That book for me was a big turning point. Yeah. And for me obviously it was about face reading that sure. for the first time. And and the first time I read it, I read it cuz it was the most awesome war story. Or or I shouldn't say the most cuz I, you know, you, you can't compare cuz with the old breed. <sighs> hmm. T- tough, tough to outdo. Colder than hell, though. Yeah. Colder than hell. When the Marines, when the wounded, starving, frostbitten Marines are rolling back into base camp after escaping the envelopment, and somebody calls out, fall in, and they start marching back into camp, and the other Marines line up and, like, salute them. I mean, come on. Yeah. So, but about face for me, there's definitely, the first time I read it was like an awesome war story. And then the second time I read it, it was like, hmm, there, there's, there's a little bit more here there, here than I originally saw. And then as you read it five times, you go, oh man, that's a gem. Oh, the, oh, I never, my intuition is completely wrong and this is clearly the right way to do it. So yeah. Putting these, putting yourself into these situations, is a is a way I think we'll we'll start to open the door on how to read this stuff where it will have the most benefit and impact for you. Yeah. 
Back to the book. Exercises also test the ability of units to sustain tempo for an extended period of time. Since victory is rarely the product of single actions, the ability to operate and sustain combat effectiveness over time is important. Knowing when hostilities will cease is a convenience denied the combat marine. Equipment must be maintained and people must be sustained with adequate rest, nourishment, and hygiene until they accomplish their mission. Tactical exercises can range from field exercises to command post exercises to tactical exercises without field troops. Field exercises conducted by units of any size involved, involve all unit personnel working together to learn, test, and refine their collective battlefield skills. Such exercises can be general in nature or they can be detailed rehearsals for specific upcoming missions. Command post exercises are largely limited to commanders and their staff. Their purpose is to familiarize the staff with their commander's personnel, personal preferences and operating styles as well as to exercise staff techniques and procedures to review a particular, to review particular contingency plans. So for those of you that aren't in the military, sometimes the leadership, the staff can rehearse and practice and do exercises as if there's a, as if there's a, their maneuver elements elements out in the field or working. And even though they're not. Um, Tactical exercises without troops provide tactical leaders opportunities to exercise judgment while permitting other unit elements to conduct training and education on their own. There, there are two approaches to conducting them. The first method provides a leader an opportunity to evaluate a subordinate's ability to perform in a given scenario. Boom, scenario-based training, role-playing. You don't need anybody. You don't need anybody in the field. You can make it happen. This method prov- places students in an area of operations and provides a situation upon which to plan and execute a task. For example, establish a reverse slope defense. The aim here is to exercise tactical proficiency in the sighting of weapons and the use of terrain. The second method also places the student in an area of operations and provides a situation but gives them a mission or a mission order. For example, prevent enemy movement north of Route 348. The aim here is to exercise judgment. After walking the ground, the students must first decide whether to defend or attack, supporting their conclusions with reasoning. The reasoning is then discussed and criticized. This approach encourages students to demonstrate ingenuity and initiative. They have free reign to employ their resources as they see fit to achieve the desired results. So just putting people in scenarios, and and then uh, equally important is discussing and criticizing and Asking people why they're doing what they're doing, why they made that decision, figuring out how they're thinking and why they're thinking. Yeah, that part, that that last part of, hey, why did you do this? And not the, why did you do this? Not that why, Mm -hmm. like you're wrong and I need to know what you're, you're like, hey, what were you seeing that made you think to do this? And look, if it turns out that it's just tactically a mistake and you, no, pro, no, no factor, this stuff is free. You're not really moving people around. You're not really spending gas. None of that is happening. Mm-hmm. You can do this all day long. But it's the leaders that actually ask, hey, wh- why were you doing that? <laughs> what were you seeing there that you start to – that's also – I remember being asked as a young flight lead, having senior flight leads, more often than not, it's like, what are you doing? And you don't want to answer and you're like, I'm sorry, I mustn't – some, the good, the best guys I ever flew with go, hey man, wh- what did you see there? I'm like, well, I saw this and that, and often they weren't seeing it, mm-hmm. and that ended up becoming that built my confidence up. That hey, it's like you were describing earlier, my brain actually is working pretty good. What I lack is the confidence mm-hmm. to take action on what I see because I'm afraid he's going to think there's something wrong with it. And the the takeaway from this, and we see it with companies all the time, is they think training is elaborate, <laughs> and training requires all these things. It doesn't require anything. You could sit at a table like this and have the conversation. And if you have a strong enough relationship, go, hey, man, what what were you thinking there? When I started to figure out that my instincts were pretty good and I understood it better than I thought and I started to build my confidence, I started to contribute to the organization better. And uh, that comes from the leaders when they say, and the critique, and then I was willing to be criticized. I wasn't defensive about being criticized. I was actually listening to their point of view as well. And it's not that hard. It's just a little humility from leadership. I go, well, what'd you see, man? Why? That's pretty good. I never, I didn't see it like that. These conversations aren't that hard. And they're free. They're free. 
Next section, wargaming. War games can be a valuable tool for understanding the many factors that influence a leader's decisions. Morale, enemy and friendly situations, the higher commander's intentions, firepower, mobility and terrain are only a few of the decision factors included in the play of war games. In all these simulations, from the sand table to a commercial board game to a computerized simulation, routine should be avoided. The less familiar the environment, the more creativity the student must display. Sand table exercises, tactical decision games, and map exercises present students with a general situation, mission orders, and a minimum of information on enemy and friendly forces. Sand table exercises are especially suited to novice tacticians. They present the terrain in a three-dimensional array, whereas a map requires interpretation. Both map and sand table exercises enable students to conceptualize the battle, deliver their decisions, and issue orders to subordinates. Afterwards, students discuss their decisions and are critiqued. The the discussion should focus on making a decision in the absence of perfect information or complete intelligence. Those are, again, these are things that are free. Free, you can do with your business, you can do with your team, you can do with your platoon. Next section, terrain walks. Terrain walks introduce the realities of terrain, vegetation, and weather. Terrain walks can be conducted in at least two ways. The first method provides students with an area of operations, a general situation, and a mission. As in sand table and map exercises, students describe their view of the battle. Choosing one plan, the group then begins to walk the terrain according to the plan. The group will then encounter unanticipated terrain and obstacles while the instructors introduce enemy actions into the play of the problem. In this way, students must contend with the disparity between actual terrain and vegetation and maps as well as the chaos and uncertainty generated by enemy actions that invariably occur in real world operations. Just think of all the ways you as a business owner can employ that right there. Playing the bad customer, playing the good customer. I mean, there's so many ways to do this. The second method involves the firsthand study of historic battlefields. We gain a special vantage on battle by walking the ground and seeing the battlefield from the perspective of both commanders. We gain a new appreciation for historic historical commander's blunders. Often such blunders seem incomprehensible until we see the ground. Only then can we realistically consider alternative courses of action that the commander might have pursued. And interestingly, at Echelon Front right now, we've kind of, we're starting to prepare some historical battlefield walks and terrain studies that we're gonna offer up to a small number of clients. So that will be that'll be awesome. Some of the sites we're checking out right now. Yeah. Gonna be great. Next section, competition. Exercises should provide realism. The means to achieve tactical realism are competitive free play or force on force exercises. Yes. Whenever possible, unit training should be conducted in a free play scenario. This approach can be used by all leaders to develop their subordinates. It affords both leaders and unit members the opportunity to apply their skills and knowledge against an active threat. Free play scenario. So when you're setting these up, this is a li- this is just like a little tiny thing I remember doing this. So we'd have certain areas we'd be training on, let's say a base somewhere, and there'd be some area that we weren't allowed to go into. You know, for whatever administrative reasons, hey, you guys aren't allowed to go over there because that's the whatever. And the common thing would be like, hey, guys, just an admin note, you're not allowed to go over there. And I hated that because it, it ruins the free play scenario. It puts in everyone's mind that, well, you know, this is, this is like lame. <laughs> so I would say, hey, guys, yeah, you can go wherever you want. By the way, Intel indicates that there's IDs heavily planted in this area. And then sure enough, we'd plant some fake IEDs right on the border and they might hit one, but they wouldn't continue in that direction. Sure. So as you're setting up scenarios, try and make them as realistic. Because there's always constraints on a real battlefield. Don't make them admin, make them real. Yeah. What's an admin constraint? Like what, like, like, for, for like this game? Does it indicate that it's a game in their it, mind? It indicates Is that, that, that it it's a game in their mind. So you might have, let's say we have a, let, let's say this, we're going to a, 
uh, an urban terrain village and the army says, hey, this one building we got over here, the it's unsafe and we don't want your guys going in it. Mm. And so instead of me saying, okay guys, it's free play except for this building, it's not safe so don't go in there. And everyone goes, that's kind of lame, right? Yes. Whereas if I say, hey guys, f- do whatever you want. This building right here, heavily IED'd. Mm. Intel reports indicate that it is heavily IED'd and if you go in there, you're, you are almost guaranteed to take a casualty. And yeah. then in the doorway, I put an IED, right. a fake IED. And it's like, yeah. yeah. So it just keeps the mindset yeah. in sense. the game. Yeah, fully. We did that in aviation all the time. We'd go out to a range, you know, Nellis or whatever, and you'd have part of the range, and some of the part you wouldn't have because another squadron was training there. And most of the admin briefs were, hey, we don't have this range and this range. Stay out of there because, you know, you're not supposed to be the other guys in there training below X altitudes to avoid them. The good flight leads would say, we have a SAM ring here from mm-hmm. this surface to air. Th- guess which guess which scenario had more violations of that range? The one where you had a SAM ring where you'd die in the, in the mission, you'd die yeah. and get colored out and you wouldn't get to fight anymore. Or the admin violation, they would just yeah. say, move to the north, you're in violation of the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And making it realistic isn't that hard. There's a whole bunch of places that we would fly all the time where you can't go there. Why? That's Iran. Yeah. They have this system yeah. here, you don't want to fly there. Not because it's an administrative border. Totally. And 95% of the time, the, the one that you would violate would be, you're not allowed to be there. Why? Well, you're just not because we don't have it today yeah. and whatever. <laughs> or, or you put a, a live threat there and guys like, I don't, I'm not going to, I don't want to get killed. <laughs> there you go. Make it realistic. Free play exercises are adaptable to all tactical scenarios and benefit, uh, beneficial to all echelons. Whether it is fire teams scouting against fire teams, sections of aircraft dueling in the sky, do you get, a little bit, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> you like that, don't you? I do. Or battalions, or companies, battalions, squadrons, and marine air ground task force operating against one another. Both leaders and individual marines benefit. Leaders form and execute their decisions against an opposing force as individual marines employ their skills against an active enemy. Through free play exercises, marines learn to fight as an organization and deal with a realistically challenging foe. Next section is about critiques. A key attribute of decision makers is their ability to reach decisions with clear reasoning. Critiques elicit this reasoning. Critiques elicit this reasoning process. Any tactical decision game or tactical exercise should culminate with a critique. The standard approach for conducting critiques should be, should promote initiative. Since every tactical situation is unique and since no training situation can encompass more than a small fraction of the peculiarities of a real tactical situation, there can be no ideal school solution. Critique should focus on the student's rationale for for doing what they did. So there's, it's like you said, I'm not going to say, Dave, you chose this method. That method was wrong. I mean, okay, are there exceptions to that? Yeah, you could do something that was tactically unsound, and then we talk about it. But you made a decision. Let's talk about why you made that decision. What factors did a student consider or not consider in making an estimate of the situation? Were the decisions the student made consistent with the estimate? Were the actions ordered tactically sound? Did they have a reasonable chance of achieving success? How well were orders communicated to subordinates? These questions should should form the basis for critiques. The purpose is to broaden the leader's analytical powers experience level and base of knowledge, thereby increasing the student's creative ability to devise sound, innovative solutions to difficult problems. And I used to explain to my guys when I was running training that the goal was not to, the goal of training was not to put their brain in a box, it was to open up all those doors and allow them to make decisions that they, that aren't, that aren't standard. Critiques should be open-minded and understanding rather than rigid and harsh. I'll read that again. Critiques should be open-minded and understanding rather than rigid and harsh. This is the big, tough United States Marine Corps telling everyone that your critiques should be understanding. Yes. Why? Because mistakes are essential to the learning process and should always be cast in a positive light. Mistakes 
are essential to the learning process and should always be cast in a positive light. Imagine if you applied that to your children. The focus should not be on whether a leader did well or poorly, but rather on the progress achieved in the overall development. Win or learn, as I talked about in Warrior Kid. You're gonna win or you're gonna learn. That's the Marine Corps saying. We must aim to provide the best climate to grow leaders. Damaging a leader's self-esteem, especially in public, therefore should be strictly avoided. And that's exactly what you talked about, Dave. You talked about the good, the good uh, leaders that would build your confidence, but I'm sure along the way you had guys that were like, the hell were you doing, Burke? For sure. Yeah, look, your, your best tool to figure out how to not make a mistake in combat is to figure out the mistakes you made in training. That's the best thing you can do is figure out all the things you did wrong. And what that sort of relied on over time, what you actually wanted to get to is guys willing to admit the mistakes that they made that people didn't see. Mm. And look, and, and that's that's magnified in a single seat airplane. Most people didn't see a lot of what I, a lot of my mistakes <laughs> people didn't see. Uh, or you could certainly cover them up. If you had a squadron where guys were willing to, hey, you didn't see this, but I screwed this thing up by myself. If you get to that point, now you're you're at a place where that squadron is literally inside on the idea of, hey, I'm just here to make everybody better. I'm I'm not afraid of admitting any mistake that I made. And I'd be a squadron, and you see the senior guys that would just crush the junior guys. And guess what they did with all those little mistakes? They would hide them all. All those little things that you might not hear about that that you're never going to see. I'm not going to volunteer and I'm not going to get crushed again. And you know who you're hurt, hurting when you're doing that? The whole team. Mm-hmm. You're crushing the whole team. And if you can get to a point where your guys are offering up errors that you didn't even see, now you're at a place where you know you've got a team willing to to figure out all the, And how, how do you think that team's going to do in combat? How do you think that team's going to do in the real world? Um, but, yeah, man, all the time, ego gets in the way you see these guys. And what they really want to do is they want to look smarter in front of everybody else, and they're going to do it at your expense. Uh, and yeah, that that feels good for about thirty seconds. Yeah. I crushed this guy in public. Well, guess what? You actually hurt yourself in the long run. You hurt the team in the long run. And it, it's so obvious when we talk about it, but it happens all the time. God, who looks at a leader that crushes someone in public and goes, "Wow, that was oh, cool. dude was awesome. That was so <laughs> awesome. That was so cool." With uh, T.U. Bruiser, we would because when you get done with a run, whether it's a land warfare or urban or whatever, yeah. you debrief, and then the cadre debriefs you, and. You know, the cadre usually just rips task units apart, but task unit bruiser, we would hammer ourselves so hard that the cadre would be like, yeah, we got nothing else. Go get ready for another run. Yeah. And this is how they close out this little section. A leader's self-confidence is the wellspring from which flows the willingness to assume responsibility and exercise initiative. So every moment that you are cutting down a leader's confidence, you are crushing their their willingness to assume responsibility, take ownership, and exercise initiative. Which is what you need them to which do. Which is what you absolutely need them to do. Crazy. And here is the conclusion. In this publication, we have explored themes that help us to understand the fundamentals and to master the art and science of tactics. From the study of our warfighting philosophy, we have gained an appreciation for the requirement to be decisive in battle. To accomplish this, we must clearly visualize the battle space gained through gained situational awareness, recognize patterns, and make decisions intuitively. We have also discussed ways we can gain advantage over the enemy and force him to bend to our will. We also explored how to be faster in relation to the enemy, to adapt to changing conditions, to cooperate for success, to exploit success, and to finish the enemy. Finally, we discussed how we can begin to act on these ideas during our training for combat. The ideas presented in this publication have implications far beyond battlefield tactics and the doctrinal way we think about warfare. They also influence the way we organize. Using task organization and flexible command and control relationships and the way we equip ourselves for combat. Waging war in maneuver warfare style demands a professional body of officers and Marines schooled in its science and art. 
When asked why the Marines were so successful in Operation Desert Storm, General Boomer replied, the thing that made the big difference on the battlefield is that we had thousands and thousands of individual Marines constantly taking the initiative. The young Lance Corporal would take a look, see something 75 or 100 meters out in front that needed to be done and go out there and do it without being told. As I read through the award citations from Desert Shield and Desert Storm, this theme reappears time and time again. That aggressive spirit comes from being well-trained and confident in your professional knowledge. And here's how they close this thing out. Everything we do in peacetime should prepare us for combat. Our preparation for combat depends upon training and education that develop the action and thought essential to battle. And that wraps up MCDP 1 TAC 3 tactics. Everything we do in peacetime should prepare us for combat. Everything. (laughs) And let's just take that one step further that everything that you do matters. It matters. And I know that everyone's not necessarily preparing for combat. but we are actually preparing for life for the next opportunity that we are going to see and we are going to seize and we are going to exploit or the next obstacle or the next crisis. We have to be ready and everything we do should prepare us for that. So don't take it easy and don't slack off be ready to aggressively attack or counter and get the upper hand and then be ready to exploit repeatedly until you finish the enemy. That's what we're doing here. (laughs) All right. Good review. I did not think this was going to take four podcasts. <laughs> yeah. What's well, probably eight to ten hours, I guess. I guess maybe around eight hours. But that is eight hours well spent. And I hope that I hope that people listening to this, clearly my number one priority is I hope that the folks that are going to be going out on the front lines to protect this country can get something and take something away from, from this series of podcasts. Kind of, it's been awesome having you here, Dave, to hear your pr- perspective from the Marine Corps, to hear your perspective from just how closely these things relate. Air, ground doesn't matter. No. It's like it's the same thing. It is. It's leadership, it's tactics. They're all related. Check. Did you think we would go that deep? No, I, I didn't. <laughs> and I actually. I learned so much just listening to it again. Uh, And that for me was probably the most fun is me just sitting here hearing you say the words that I've read before a couple times and making the connections to a whole bunch of things that I had made the connection on before. This was, I mean, look, this was awesome for me to be here. Uh, And of all the the books to be talking about Marine Corps tactics, that's that's good to go. Yeah. So check. Echo Charles. Yes. Speaking of being prepared for combat, for life. Sure. I know you're pretty, you're pretty into that. (laughs) Sure. You know? Oh yeah. Big deal. You got that, uh, dot five Oh (laughs) Cal desert Eagle. Sure. Was that your first handgun that you got? Uh, well, you know, technically. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good. I bought a bunch of them together. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, so the first one that I paid for and signed for, yeah, technically. 
Desert Eagle. But it came. Out. It took a while for it to come in. So yeah. into you know before it came in, I got other ones. So, Check. You know, I bet it's cool to shoot that thing. Yeah. Well, you do Away. know. Oh yes, sir. I did. Mm-hmm. It was that thing was awesome. Yeah. Preparedness. That's part of your preparedness. Yeah. Very practical. Um. Because I also have a refrigerator, so you know, if someone attacks me, they hide behind the refrigerator. Boom! I'm prepared. You see what I'm saying? Oh, because you got the the Desert Eagle. Can shoot through the refrigerator. You got the penetration that you need yeah. for the in-house scenario. In-house scenario. What if you don't have a weapon? What can you use? The, uh, okay. So, and I think about this too a lot. Mm-hmm. Not a lot. We'll just say some of the time where <laughs> yes, you can, uh, you can be prepared with weapons. Because most of the time you're thinking about like if you want to talk about what you think about a lot, it's like. <laughs> Hawaii Five-0, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> Mario Brothers, None Super the, Mario Brothers. Super Mario, yes, nonetheless, <laughs> you can be prepared with Somebody weapons. Somebody called you Echo, nonetheless, Charles. Yeah, just yeah. saying. Yeah, and that's do a, what you want. That's with that information. that's a quasi important point too, because I don't say nevertheless. Cause some people sit, will try to tease me and be like, "Oh yeah, you say nevertheless," but I don't say never, nevertheless. Dang. But say we're splitting hairs. I don't want to split hairs. Anyway. Like I was trying to say, you can be prepared with weapons, Desert Eagle or otherwise. But what if you like don't have ammo, the <laughs> weapon fails, or you simply don't have the weapons? I know like we're encouraged to have your tools on you at all times. I yes, get it. But are they on you at all times? They should be. Yeah. But let's say you're in the shower. Let's say you're picking up your kids from school. No yeah. gun zone. <laughs> What if you're on the airplane? Check. Yeah, there you go. Two or good in the scenarios. airport, past security, you see what I'm saying? Two good scenarios. Anyway, it's possible is what I'm saying. So then what do you have? And I'm not saying like you need to be Bruce Lee, uh, Hoist Gracie or something like this, but don't have nothing. Mm-hmm. Don't go from level 10 prepared to level zero mm-hmm. in one pass of the security checkpoint, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So what can you have? You can have the jujitsu. <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. Anyway, so yes, we're doing jujitsu, and the good part about this is like this preparedness for uh, taking jujitsu is fun, beneficial health-wise, and also therapeutic. So mentally fun is or mentally uh, conducive. Did you see the big fight at Disney World? Negative. Disneyland. Did you see it? It was on YouTube or yeah. whatever. Oh, like a fight fight? Yeah, big no, fight. I big didn't man. Know about but it. at some point, some some dude just walks up and puts a dude to sleep and then walks away. The yes. No factor. Yeah, just comes money. in incognito, walks up behind him, puts him to sleep, lays him down, and walks away. Yeah. So that's jujitsu. That's mm-hmm. that's that's one month of jujitsu. Because yep. I was sitting here thinking, you hear the argument, well, you know, it's, I don't have too much time to invest and in how good can I really get? Like you train for a month yeah. and you can put someone to sleep. Oh yeah. Train for one month, just two times a week. And and I'm not saying you will, you'll be effective against another jujitsu. Oh, no, I'm not no, no, saying you're that, not going to be, but you compare yourself to the guy who doesn't know any jujitsu, which is a lot of people. By and the here's way. the question. When are you going to be attacked? It might be in a month, but it might yeah. be in two years. In two years, you could be that much more prepared for the situation. Yeah. And on top of all that benefit of just this pure self-defense aspect, mm-hmm. you got in better condition and you broadened your view of the world. Yeah. You became a better human being. Your perspective is better. Yeah. You see the thread in all things. Yes, you will. So you do. So we're doing jujitsu, by the way. Oh yeah, big time. <laughs> And, and it makes sense when people go in the first day, second day, and they get addicted yeah. because they see the power, whether it's demonstrated on them or if you just learn. Okay, I have a six-year-old daughter currently. She's six. So I'm not saying to do this, but I'm saying this is an example of how it can be kind of fun and empowering. So I taught her the rear naked choke. Mm-hmm. It's fun to do that if you teach kids who are responsible with it. You don't need them going to school and choking out everybody. I understand. Actually, you need them not doing that. Yes, correct. You have to explain to them that this is not for school. Yeah. Unless it's a serious self-defense scenario. Yes. And there's a whole, you know, protocol with that. But so we're at a party on Kauai. And, you know, we're like, hey, you know, you're t- we're talking about this, talking about that. And my daughter, she wants to demonstrate the rear naked choke. Yeah. And most people, if they don't know about the rear naked choke, they're like, oh, my God, you're six. You know, you're not. Gonna- yeah, exactly. Right. And she was like, all right, well, just uh, let her put it on you. And, you know, like if you can resist it, cool, man, you're right. And. Did she put someone to sleep? No. The the thing is, you you know when you're going to sleep. Even I mean, how's this? My 
wife's nephew put my wife's brother to sleep before. There but he know. was like 14, 15 years old. But nonetheless, so these kids or even adults, whatever, they'll learn these these moves first day and they'll become addicted mm. because they know the power, the power that a 66-year-old can get mm. in one day, by the way, not even one day, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. really. And they have the potential to put an adult to sleep. Crazy. Whether it be at it's a Disneyland crazy or superpower. other places. Yes, sir. So one, you're trained jiu jitsu, you're gonna need a gi. If you're doing gi, I recommend gi and no gi. So if you're doing gi, when you're doing gi, get a origin gi from originmain.com. Made good. in America. Made in America, best gis, 100% by far factually. Yeah, and maybe you're a patriotic person. Maybe you maybe. just like to support the economy in this country. Well, years ago, they took the economy away from Maine. They took it away. Yeah. They sold it overseas. We are bringing it back. So if you want to train jiu-jitsu, and you want to at the same time support the economy of our country, go to Origin Maine. And if you aren't training jiu-jitsu, or you're gonna train jiu-jitsu and you got an Origin gi, but you don't want to wear that gi to the store. <laughs> <laughs> sure, because yeah. you want because you don't want to be that guy, right? Wearing you get the store. Have yeah. you ever worn a gi to a store? Negative, not even. Close. I have not either. Yeah, I saw a kid with a yeah. Gi you see kids with store. gis in the store. More the gi my pants, daughter's worn. My youngest daughter has worn her gi. Actually, I think all my kids have worn my my kids have worn their gis straight up out to dinner. <laughs> You know when they were little kids and stuff, just bringing them from jujitsu. Oh, yeah. They're just straight wearing their gis. The whole gi belt tied everything. Belt tied everything. Dang, you know, I'm right. not gonna disrespect that gi. Oh, man. But yeah, my little daughter, even right now, I mean, she's ten. But you know, if we're gonna go grab some food afterwards after jujitsu class, we might. You know, she might be in her gi. No Keep factor. Gi on. Yeah, all good. I know that kind of that kind of improves their. It improves their posture. Yeah, yeah. When they're, they're wearing the gi. Oh yeah. They're kind of got that 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 I could see improved that. self esteem. Yeah. When they're wearing that gi. Yeah, in their mind they're walking gi. around. They're like, hey, they see what I'm wearing. Yeah. There's no mistake. They see what I'm wearing. Basically, I'm training. <laughs> I'm over here training. What yeah. are you doing? That's yeah. what my little ten year old daughter's walking around saying. It's good. She's not saying it verbally, but she's right. giving that yeah. implicit message to the world. I'm over here training. Yeah. What are you doing? Eating donuts? That's what it looks like. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. All right. So yeah. If you don't if you don't want to wear your gi, you can wear jeans. Sure. We have jeans at origin. We yeah. have t shirts at origin. And we have supplements at Origin to help your physical and mental and cognitive power. Preparedness. Let's keep you prepared. Because really, that's what, it, yeah, so so krill oil, joint warfare, these are for your joints and general health. Because, you know, curcumin, that's in joint warfare. Mm -hmm. So there's anti-inflammatory stuff in there, really good stuff. This will keep you in the game physically. Like your joint, like, man. And again, I said this before where, you know, when you think supplements, we're thinking creatine. Mm. Stay jacked. You know, <laughs> implement gains because of the supplements. The base, the base, this is what I think you've been trying to say for the last three years or however long. Mm -hmm. the, the foundational supplementation yeah. should be focused on joint health. Yeah. You know what that's like? <clears throat> so, and I might have said this before, maybe, maybe not, whatever, but it's true. I might have been nodding, listening to you. Yeah, so you is, wouldn't really know. Yeah. Yes, yes, I get, I get it. And <laughs> you're not wrong on that one, but this is still correct. It's like when you take these creatine, protein things, it can be looked at Is it like this. If you don't take the foundational joint or joint stuff, stuff that'll keep you in the game capable. You'll overpower. No, it's like you're watering. Like if you have a plant or a tree, it's like you're watering the leaves. Oh, you I see what I'm understand. saying? No, you water the roots. Yeah. The roots Look allow anything to grow on top Look there. And then it's going to be, you know, based on hard work and discipline and, and consistency, all that Check. stuff. Check. But you water the roots. The roots are strong, bright. You're going to stay in the game. Same thing with your joints. Mm -hmm. 100%. Check. Uh, Dave, last time you talked about the Discipline Go pill, which I know you take prior to, to quote you from last time, prior to anything. <laughs> But I also know that you pound quite a bit of the discipline pre-op powder drink, dude. You hammer that I stuff. I do. <laughs> the go in all forms has become my go-to go. supplement. Yeah. I, I use it everywhere. I, I do. I, and you know, we were kind of kidding around. 
I'm I'm dead serious. If I want to be in the game mentally, which I do for kind of everything, mm-hmm. other than watching TV, right? Because we don't need to be in the game, right? <laughs> I'm gonna be honest with you. <laughs> no, wrong. Watching actually. TV. No, I'm I'm in full agreement. Watching TV for me, which is a relatively rare event, that's a uh, boy. I, that's a social obligation. No, I was gonna say not to go into your personal life, but you were telling me the other day when you watch TV, it is not for you. It is. It is for your family. It is. It it's is, like, hey, we're yeah, gonna watch it's this a thing. Deposit, and you're like, yeah, absolutely. You're like, cool. I'll sit down and watch this, and I'll. For me, it's like time to sleep. It is. Yeah, yeah. I will power nap. I will. Sl- I will sleep through. I take my kids to movies. My wife and I will take our kids to movies. Oh. I have a 100% oh, yeah. success rate of sleeping through a majority oh, of oh, those yeah. movies. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm going to miss that whole movie. Important question then. Are you going to take discipline, go or otherwise, when you're watching the new Top Gun movie? Oh, this is a whole situation. There's a Did very you? strong chance that I will. Because that will probably be the first movie. Not just because I want to see what happens. Because I am sure I'm going to get 10 or more questions yeah. about that movie yep. at the completion of it, and I want to know. What, are you in it? Like what accuracy no. questions? You're, you're not in it. Are you? Did you advise in, on it or anything? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you're kind of on the so hook. You're kind of bit. in it. Maybe. Yeah. I'm not in it. You won't see me. Will you won't see, see my name in the credits. But are you asking me if I was involved in it? Maybe. <laughs> Wait, well, all of a sudden he's doing top secret missions for Hollywood over the, here. The only reason I would say maybe is that I wouldn't be able to allow I wouldn't be allowed to tell you based on when I contributed to that movie. Oh, right. Jack. So he'd be allowed to t- or no, he could tell you, but then he'd have to kill you. No, I tell him. And Good then luck I, yeah, with yeah. that. Bro, <laughs> that's the line from Top Gun, the main original oh, yeah. one. Yeah, it's classified. It's right. cla- oh, yeah. Right, you guys. Anyway, so yes, discipline go while watching the new Top yes. Gun. It's called Maverick, by the way. Anytime I want to be engaged it. in something, I'm taking go. Hell yeah. Which is basically every waking hour of my work day and not when I'm watching TV. Yeah, because that's, that's sort of the thing that I was getting to is, you know, you might drink, uh, hey, I'm thirsty, I'm going to have a, have a glass of water. Hey, I'm thirsty, I'm going to get a Coke or a Sprite if you're a human, Crazy if you're a person that doesn't care about getting after it but if you're a, if you're a person that does care about getting after it you can be like oh I'm kind of thirsty I'm gonna have some discipline go and I'm just gonna get up on step and I'm gonna stay there yes because mm-hmm. <laughs> there's no overload load of caffeine by the way there's no there's very little caffeine 15 yeah, and, milligrams per scoop yeah and it mm. doesn't take much too you don't no. need to be pounding five six cans of it, it doesn't take no. much to get on the step yeah I'm with them so there's I'm with you there right if you there. do need protein then you can get some from Molk, which is Molk disguised as protein. Well, actually, yeah. it is protein yeah. in the form yeah. of a dessert. Yeah, and so you can check that out. We keep talking about how good it is, and yes, it is that good. And Warrior Kid Molk, you can get for the childrens that you may or may not have yeah. formulated. Formulates. And of course, tea. Another thing that you can drink all day long. Hot in the winter time, cold in the summertime. So there you go. That's originmain.com. Also, Jocko has a store. It's called Jocko Store. Anyway, this is where you can get shirts, discipline equals freedom. You know, represent the path while you're on the path. You know, rash guards, hoodies, hats, dry, not dry fit. No, we're going to get dry fit uh, stuff, by the way. Oh, we are. Shirts, yes, for working out. Overwhelming recommendations for dry fit. I got a dry who, fit. Who recommended that, that you finally, because I've been asking you that for 14 years. Before I even knew you, I was asking you that. I know, bro. And you know what? That's that's <laughs> <laughs> before you knew you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I get it. And you were right. You were right. And here's, oh. here's why I'm arriving to that conclusion, even on an emotional level. Okay. So one of our friends, and I wish I could. I could. Divulge. Um, no, no, I wish I could remember his name. Oh, okay. He gave me a dry fit okay. shirt representing his team. And it's like, it's it's a cool, it's a red one. So I'm like, oh yeah, cool. I don't really wear a dry fit, but hey man, cool. Mm-hmm. So one day I put it on and I was like, man, this thing is good. Like it fits good. It like feels good. It's lighter. It's like breathes. You know, I was like, man, I could wear it. So then another time I went and worked out in it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, okay. That's when I became a believer in the dry fit. I always thought they just didn't, Look good or something like that. I don't know. They you didn't. thought they didn't look good? Yeah. Check. See, that's the big difference between you and me. I go form over 
I go I go function first. Yes. And you go looks. Well. Yes. Yeah. Oh, kind of like on White Men Can't Jump. Remember that movie? When he's I like, do remember that. Jump you'd right. rather look good and lose than the other, you know, Option. look bad and win or something like that. Mm-hmm. Woody Har- Harrelson. Check. Kind of like that. Anyway, so yes, I'm like, okay. I'm a believer fully, so boom, dry fit. Coming soon, we're gonna have dry fit stuff. Discipline equals freedom. Also, lightweight hoodies, flex fit hats, and trucker hats, by the way. Check. Chocostore.com. Yep. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. If you've forgotten for three years, for three years, if you've forgotten to subscribe to the podcast, put it on your list of things to do sure. in the coming year. Sure. Subscribe to it. And don't forget to subscribe to the Warrior Kid podcast so that your little kids are just aligned with your thought process. Isn't that a nice thing? Yeah. Dave, your kids, do your kids absorb, do, let me think of a way to write, answer this, ask this correctly without being offensive. Do your kids listen to Uncle Jake or you? Which one gets the higher priority? <laughs> <laughs> the, the the question is is they listen to both but the success rate that <laughs> uncle jake has is significantly higher yeah <laughs> that's what i would say i can't do this experiment with my kids yep. because my kids don't differentiate right. between mm-hmm. these these things they just they're just you know they, that's what they get. So your youngest, when she first heard the Warrior Kid podcast, you were like, ask Uncle Jake, and you'd be like, bro, that's just you. Yeah, yeah. Like, she knows like, what's behind the curtain already. Yeah. She heard your voice. You know, Nareet? Sure, of someone, course. Someone said, to, she, someone asked Nareet, Nareet is a female black belt that we have at the gym. In the you should and, and someone was, and she, I mean, we spent a lot of time on the mat for the last 10 years or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so, and I've given her, I gave her some advice over the years, right? Sure, yeah. Little counseling sessions about things. Yeah. And it's worked out really well for her. Mm-hmm. And anyway, someone else asked her a question. And she was answering it. And the person goes, God, you, you sound just like Jocko Podcast. <laughs> and Marie goes, I don't listen to Jocko Podcast. Mm-hmm. And then, I, and then she told me that story, and I said, "Well, you don't listen to Jocko Podcast. You listen to me. Yeah, <laughs> you, yeah. you listen. You've been mm-hmm. already hearing this stuff for ten years. Yep. So there you go. Same thing. So the the children sometimes, it's a it's a little bit of a hit on the ego, because you think, well, I want my kid to listen to me. Yeah. But you know what? I want my kid. I want my kid to listen to someone that's making sense. Yeah. It's only a hit on your ego. If it's more important they listen to you than for them to be successful, yeah, yeah, then it's not <laughs> yeah. like, oh, they're gonna go win, good to go. I don't yeah. care where it came from. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would rather. That's like what you just said, Echo. I would rather my kids listen to me and lose, lose. Yeah. than yeah. listen to someone yeah. else and yeah. win. Yeah. So we gotta watch out for that. Don't out. forget about the Warrior Kids soaps, IrishOaksRanch.com, where young Aiden is making soap on a farm in California. If you use that soap, you can stay clean. Yep. YouTube channel. Yeah, we do have a YouTube channel. If you're interested in the video version of this podcast. If you want to see how much Dave Burke looks like Tom Cruise. Yeah, <laughs> which is not zero. Like, there's some overlap there. There is. What's the overlap? They're, I don't know, their hair, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> they have the same hair, yeah. is what I'm saying. Check. You're taller, I think. You got, you know. Yeah, man, all good. So you can check out what Dave looks You can also look at the videos that... Echo's super proud of, overly proud of. Then you can put comments on those things. And he reads them, I read them. Uh-huh. I read the little comments on there. <laughs> Usually someone writes, Echo's jacked. Yep. I've, uh, and someone else writes, Echo has skinny knees. Yeah, yeah, there is that one. Uh, yeah, you gotta and take the good and the bad. Bro. I'm not saying I read is. the comments. I'm not saying I don't read the comments. You definitely but I'm, read the comments. I am saying from time to time, when I do read a comment across various platforms, I will say this. When someone does say Echo is or looks jacked, the number of A's in Jack has been steadily increasing. Mm-hmm. So that mean you're getting more jacked? <laughs> so I posted I posted a couple um, things on on the gram. Sure, the gram. Yeah, the Instagram. Mm-hmm. And I was reading those comments. Those comments 
are almost worth reading aloud. Some of them are so funny. <laughs> yeah, Especially agreed. when I made a salad yeah. on Instagram in three minutes. It takes yeah. three minutes to make this salad. And the, some of the comments that people were making about, I can't believe you eat chicken from, from a can. can. Yep. You had to come in and give me fire support on that one. Well, yeah, I a little bit. You. Yeah. So yeah, those were those were uh, those were funny. I think yeah. I might make a little. I think I might make a little video of me reading some of those comments. I was laughing out loud when I was reading those comments. Yeah, yeah. Those yeah, very good. What My are wife you doing that drinking video. milk? Oh yeah, dairy. It's That's like I was drinking. You. It's like I was drinking formaldehyde. <laughs> I mean, it was just some people were just getting crazy. But I like that some people were just. So super stoked Amen. and saying that sounds cool, man. Yeah, and I mix my I mix my salad dressing in a used water bottle. Yeah, you mix a lot of stuff in a used. Water I know. Bottle, I'm, by I'm, the way, I'm, uh, I'm pro used, but people were like, you know, some people were like, "There's BPA. Oh, yeah, B- yeah. You, know, you got it. You're gonna die." <laughs> I'm like, dude, take it easy. Yeah. Amen. So you know. That, that's a good here's the thing though overall if those things get in them it, this is for real like how quick you made a set because i make a salad similar mm-hmm. to that like just super basic yeah. and boom, boom where some people they think wait you make a salad every day like bro making a salad is a big deal you got to chop up the thing and it's boom it's this whole <laughs> gourmet thing it's like three bah. minutes and yeah not even yeah three yeah. minutes exactly three minutes. right Done. oh yeah and then guess what i did have the eating can salad open. i did have the can of chicken open pre-opened yeah there you go three minutes ten seconds easy money but no because most people they're like oh wait i have uh don't have time or whatever so what are they gonna make a freaking hot pocket in the freaking microwave yeah. you know which is horrible for yeah. you is that worse than salad Salad dressing mixed in a water bottle? I think in, yes. In canned chicken? Yeah, man. So, and that's really the point right there. It's like, oh, Bro, yeah, you're I, eating canned chicken. Then I did the workspace video. Yeah. And people were like, you're going to get carpal, t- uh, whatever that's carpal called. Tunnel. And someone else said, your posture is going to break down. I mean, wait, what? Bro, it's so <laughs> funny. Wait, man. why will you, will you get par- carpal, carpal tunnel? I don't know. Because you, type- I don't know. But I type all the time. I don't have it. So what does that mean? Oh wait, you need like an ergonomic typewriter, uh, yeah, keyboard, or something whatever. like this. Anyways, funny yeah. stuff that's uh, going on. Psychological warfare. It's an album with tracks you can get. Me talking to you about moments of weakness. Flipsidecanvas.com. That's Dakota Myers' company for artwork to hang on your wall to keep you on the path. You can rock that. And then there's onit.com/slash Jocko. Yes, good stuff on there. Kettlebells. That's the number. When I think on it, I think kettlebells, but they got a lot of lot of good stuff on there. Rings as well. That's that one that one's a key. If you don't have rings, get rings. Hundred percent. Definitely. On it.com. The books I have for you. Warrior Kid Three, Warrior Kid Two, Warrior Kid One. These are the books that will get your kids on the path. Man, like, like you know how we're reading this the whole time, Dave? And we're like, man, I wish I would have read this like type of thing when I was 20. Well, when you were nine, you wish you had the Warrior Kid books. I guarantee it. And you know what? If you didn't have them when you were nine, you're going to wish you had them when you were 38. True story, 100%. So somebody's, somebody asked me in an interview the other day, what does it mean to be a man? Right? Okay, fair enough question. And I said, Oh, it's not an easy question to answer in a quick interview, but I wrote a book about it. It's called Way of the Warrior Kid. In fact, I've written a whole series about it. It's about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a person, because there's girls and boys that read that book, and the lessons are how to live a good life as a human being. So you might want to check those out. And then Mikey and the Dragons, how old is your youngest, Dave? Five. How does Mikey and the Dragons come across? He loves that book. <laughs> and what he does now when we when we bust that thing out, he actually is spending more time with uh, Warrior Kid now because mm-hmm. he's getting older. You know what he holds when we're reading Mikey and the Dragons? He's got a sword. Yes. He's got t- so Ooh, yeah. he's super stoked because he's got a sword. I like all it. the little notes I get. And <sighs> of whatever the fear was, you know, it's like, and I told him to be like Mikey and face the dragons. And, and he stood up and jumped in the pool or he stood up and got up on stage or whatever the case may be. So, yeah, Mikey and the dragons. My boy is two. Mm-hmm. Well, he'll be three next month. 
and you know, I read it to him and, and you know, my daughter as well. And cool, good. Mm-hmm. Of course, they, you know, they like that. But they can look at the pictures too, you know, because the picture, pictures are a lot more vibrant, yeah. you know, than the worry kid ones. Yeah. I'll catch him, not often, but every once in a while, I'll catch him acting. He cannot read. He's too, you know, mm-hmm. but he's acting like he's reading it, but he's really looking at the pictures. You know how kids, they'll sometimes yeah. do that. They'll look at the pictures and they'll just assign a story to yeah. every picture, you know, and he's doing that. He's like, oh, the dragon came and it was just a baby dragon or something like this. It's like, man, but that's a testament to the pictures in there. Yeah. John Bozak John representing. Bozak coming on strong. Uh, speaking of pictures, Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. That's a, a book for adult humans. Sure. The things you want to know about life and getting after it. The audio version of that is on iTunes, Amazon Music, Google Play, and other MP3. And then Extreme Ownership and the Dichotomy of Leadership. Leadership books I wrote with my brother Leif Babin that you can apply to everything in your world. We got Echelon Front, which is our leadership consultancy, and what we do there is solve problems through leadership. Dave and I referred back to it a hundred times. The companies we work with, that's what we do. We get them on a path where their leadership is aligned, and when your leadership is aligned, your company will absolutely win. And when your leadership is not aligned, guess what's going on? Your company is losing. Go to echelonfront.com if you want us to come and work with you. We got EF Online because training for leadership is not a one-shot, one-kill deal. Another topic that Dave and I talked about. You don't just read a book. You don't just sit through one seminar and go, oh, cool, I'm a great leader now. No, you never say that. And so we made the online training to reiterate and embed the concepts of leadership that we know to work. Embed those things into your brain and into the brain of everyone at your company. EFonline.com. We got the muster coming up. The next one is September 19th and 20th in Denver. After that, December 4th and 5th in Sydney, Australia. If you want to come, register now, or you will not be able to come because it will be sold out. Go to extremeownership.com for details there. And if you need people, if you need leaders at your company, you can get former special operations and former combat aviation leaders that are leaving the military that have been trained and have been proven with their leadership skills and you can hire them to come into your company and utilize their leadership skills to help your team and your company win. Go to efoverwatch.com for that. And if you feel like there's a bunch of topics that we haven't really covered in depth enough yet and you wanna continue to discuss them with us, then you can find us on the interwebs. We're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, and we're on Dein Friesenbach. <laughs> Echo is at Echo Charles. Dave is at David R. Burke, B E R K E. And I am at Jocko Willink. Echo, anything else? No, sir. Dave, anything else? Negative. Thanks for coming out, man. Dude, it's so good to be here. <laughs> and thanks to. Well, thanks to all of our armed forces that are out there right now that are standing on that wall and keeping us safe. And to our police and law enforcement and firefighters and paramedics and EMTs and dispatchers and correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, all the first responders. Thanks you for standing inside that wall and keeping us safe here at home. And to everyone else that's out there, try to remember how the Marine Corps wins. The Marine Corps wins by constantly taking initiative, by chasing the enemy down to the last man and killing him and throwing his remains into the river. That's how you fight. Do that. Do that with your own personal wars. Do that to your own personal weaknesses. And do not delay in the attack. The time is now. So get up and go get after it.
And until next time, this is Dave and Echo and Jocko. Out.